2. Thaumaturgic Personalities of the 18th Century The 18th century was credulous about nothing but magic, and the explanation is that vague beliefs are the religion of souls devoid of true faith. The miracles of Jesus Christ were denied, while resurrections were ascribed to the Comte de Saint-Germain. This exceptional personality was a mysterious theosophist who was credited with possessing the secrets of the great work, and the manufacture of diamonds and of precious stones. For the rest, he was a man of the world, agreeable in conversation and highly distinguished in manners. Madame de Genlis, who saw him almost daily during his early years, says that even his representations of gems in pictures had a natural fire and gleam, the secret of which could not be divined by any chemist or painter. None of his pictures are in evidence, and it can only be speculated whether he had contrived to fix light on canvas or whether he employed a preparation of mother-of-pearl or some metallic coating. The Comte de Saint-Germain professed the Catholic religion and conformed to its practices with great fidelity. This notwithstanding, there were reports of suspicious evocations and strange apparitions. He claimed also to have the secret of eternal youth. Was this mysticism or was it madness? His family connections were unknown and to hear him talk of past events suggested that he had lived for many centuries. Of all that was in kinship with occult science he said but little, and when the benefit of initiation was demanded at his hands he pretended to know nothing on the subject. He chose his own disciples, required passive obedience on their part and then talked of a royalty to which they were called, being that of Melchizedek and Solomon, a royalty of initiation, which is a priesthood at the same time. Be the torch of the world, he said. If your light is that only of a planet, you will be as nothing in the sight of God. I reserve for you a splendor, of which the solar glory is a shadow. You shall guide the course of stars and those who rule empires shall be governed by you. These promises, the proper meaning of which is quite intelligible to true adepts, are recorded substantially, if not in the words here given, by the anonymous author of A History of Secret Societies in Germany. 307 And they are evidence as to the school of initiation with which the Comte de Saint-Germain was connected. The following details have been so far unknown concerning him. The Comte de Saint-Germain was born at Lentmeritz in Bohemia, at the end of the 17th century. He was either the natural or an adopted son of a Rosicrucian who called himself Comes Cabalicus, the companion Kabbalist, ridiculed under the name of Comte de Gabalus by the unfortunate Abbé de Villers. 308 Saint-Germain never spoke of his father, but he mentions that he led a life of proscription and errantry in a world of forest, having his mother as companion. This was at the age of seven years, which, however, is to be understood symbolically and is that of the initiate when he is advanced to the grade of master. His mother was the science of the adepts, while the forest, in the same kind of language, signifies empires devoid of the true civilization and light. The principles of Saint Germain were those of the Rosy Cross. And in his own country he established a society from which he separated subsequently when anarchic doctrines became prevalent in fellowships which incorporated new partisans of the Gnosis. Hence he was disowned by his brethren, was charged even with treason, and some memorials on Illuminism seem to hint that he was immured in the dungeons of the Castle of Rule. On the other hand, Madame de Genlis tells us that he died in the Duchy of Holstein, a prey to his own conscience and terrors of the life beyond. 309 It is certain in any case that he vanished suddenly from Paris, no one exactly knowing where, and that his companions in illumination permitted the veil of silence and oblivion to fall as far as possible upon his memory. The association which he had formed under the title of Saint Jacob, which has been turned into Saint Joachim, continued till the revolution, when it dissolved or was transformed, like so many others. A story is told concerning it in a pamphlet against Illuminism. It is derived from a correspondence in Vienna and, though it is worth reproducing, there is nothing that can be termed certain or authentic therein. Owing to your introduction, I had a cordial welcome from M. N. Z., who had been informed already of my arrival. Of the harmonica he approved highly. He spoke first of all about certain trials, but of this I understood nothing. It is of late only that I have been able to grasp the meaning. Yesterday, towards evening, I accompanied him to his country house, the grounds of which are very beautiful. 
Temples, grottos, cascades, labyrinths, caves form a long vista of enchantments, but an exceedingly high wall which encompasses the whole pleasance was extremely displeasing to me, for beyond this there is also a wonderful prospect. I had brought the harmonica with me, at the instance of M. N. Z., with the idea of playing on it for a few minutes in a place indicated, and on receiving an agreed signal. 310 The visit to the garden over, he took me to a room in the front of the house and there left me, somewhat quickly and under a trivial pretext. It was now very late, he did not return. Weariness and the wish to sleep began to come over me, when I was interrupted by the arrival of several coaches. I opened the window, but, being night, I could see nothing, and I was much puzzled by the low and mysterious whispering of those who seemed entering the house. Sleep now overcame me, and an hour must have passed away, when I was awakened by a servant who was sent to conduct me and also carry the instrument. He walked very quickly and far in advance of myself, I following mechanically, when I heard the sound of horns, which seemed to issue from the depths of a cave. At this moment I lost sight of my guide and, proceeding in the direction from which the noise seemed to be coming, I half descended a staircase leading to a vault, from which, to my utter surprise, a funeral chant arose and I saw distinctly a corpse in an open coffin. On one side stood a man clothed in white, covered with blood, it appeared to me that a vein had been opened in his right arm. With the exception of those who were helping him, all present were shrouded in long black mantles and were armed with drawn swords. So far as I could judge in my state of terror, the entrance to the vault was strewn with human bones, heaped one upon another. The only light which illuminated the mournful spectacle was that of a flame, such as is produced by spirits of wine. Uncertain whether I should be able to overtake my guide, I retreated hurriedly and found him in search of myself a few paces away. There was a haggard look in his eyes, and taking my hand in rather an uneasy manner, he led me into a singular garden, where I began to think that I must have been transported by magic. The brilliance produced by a vast number of lamps, the murmur of falling waters, the singing of mechanical nightingales and the perfume which seemed to exhale everywhere exalted my imagination at the outset. I was hidden behind a green arbor, the interior of which was richly decorated, and thither they brought immediately a person in a fainting state, apparently the one who had occupied the coffin in the vault. It was at this point that I received the agreed signal to play my instrument. Disturbed very much by the whole scene, there is no doubt that a good deal escaped me 311 but I could see that the swooning person came to himself as soon as I touched the harmonica. He also began to ask questions with an accent of astonishment, saying, Where am I? What is this voice? Shouts of joy, accompanied by trumpets and timbrels, were the only answer. Everyone ran to arms and plunging into the depths of the garden were quickly out of sight. I am still in agitation as I write these lines and if I had not taken the precaution to make my notes on the spot, I should regard it today as a dream. The most inexplicable part of this scene is the presence of the uninitiated person who tells the story. How the association could thus risk the betrayal of its mysteries is a question that cannot be answered, but the mysteries themselves can be explained easily. 312 The successors of the old Rosicrucians, modifying little by little the austere and hierarchic methods of their precursors in initiation, had become a mystic sect and had embraced zealously the Templar magical doctrines. As a result of which they regarded themselves as the sole depositaries of the secrets intimated by the Gospel according to St. John. They regarded the narratives of that Gospel as an allegorical sequence of rites designed to complete initiation, and they believed that the history of Christ must be realized in the person of each one of the adepts. Furthermore, they recounted a Gnostic legend, according to which the Saviour, instead of being buried in the new tomb of Joseph of Arimathea, having been swathed and perfumed, was brought back to life in the house of St. John. This was the pretended mystery which they celebrated to the sound of horns and harmonica. 313 The candidate was invited to offer up his life and was actually subjected to bleeding which caused him to swoon. This swoon was called death and when he returned to himself, his resurrection was celebrated amidst outbursts of joy and gladness. The varied emotions produced, the scenes, by turns mournful and brilliant, must have permanently impressed the candidate's imagination, and rendered him either fanatical or lucid. 
Many believed that a real resurrection took place in themselves and felt convinced that they were no longer subject to death. The heads of the society thus had at the service of their concealed projects the most formidable of all instruments, namely, madness. And secured on the part of their adepts that blind and tireless devotion which unreason produces more often and more surely than goodwill. The sect of St. Jacob was therefore an order of Gnostics steeped in the illusions of the magic of fascination, it drew from Rosicrucians and Templars. And its particular name was one of the two names, Jachin and Boaz, hang raven on the chief pillars of Solomon's temple. In Hebrew the initial letter of Jachin is Yod, a sacred letter of the Hebrew alphabet, and also the initial of Jehovah, which divine name was indeed veiled from the profane under that of Jachin, whence the designation Saint Jachin. The members of this order were theosophists, unwisely addicted to theurgic processes. Point 314. All that is told of the mysterious Comte de Saint Germain supports the idea that he was a skillful physician and a distinguished chemist. He is said to have known how to fuse diamonds so that there was no trace of the operation, he could also purify precious stones, thus making the most common and imperfect of high value. That imbecile and anonymous author 315 whom we have already cited places the latter claim to his credit but denies that he ever made gold, as if one did not make gold in the making of precious stones. Saint Germain also invented, according to the same authority, and bequeathed to the industrial sciences, the art of imparting greater brilliance and ductility to copper, another invention sufficient to prove the fortune of him who devised it. Performances of this kind make us forgive the Comte de Saint Germain for having been acquainted with Queen Cleopatra and for chatting familiarly with the Queen of Sheba. He was otherwise good natured and gallant. He was one who loved children and amused himself by providing them with delicious sweetmeats and marvelous toys, he was dark and of small stature, dressed richly but with great taste and cultivating all the refinements of luxury. He is said to have been received familiarly by Louis XV and was engrossed with him over questions of diamonds and other precious stones. It is probable that this monarch, entirely governed by courtesans and given up to pleasure, was rather yielding to some caprice of feminine curiosity than to any serious concern for science when he invited Saint Germain to certain private audiences. The Comte was the fashion for a moment, and as he was an amiable and youthful Methuselah, who knew how to combine the tattle of a roué with the ecstasies of a theosophist, he was the rage in certain circles. Though speedily replaced by other fantasiasts. So goes the world. It is said that Saint Germain was no other than that mysterious Althotas who was the master in magic of another adept with whom we are about to be occupied and who took the Kabbalistic name of Akarath. The supposition has no foundation, as will be seen in due course. Whilst the Comte de Saint Germain was thus in request at Paris, Another mysterious adept was on his way through the world, recruiting apostles for the philosophy of Hermes. He was an alchemist who called himself Lascaris and gave out that he was an Eastern Archimandrite, charged with collecting alms for a Greek convent. The distinction was this, that instead of demanding money, Lascaris seemed occupied, so to speak, in sowing his path with gold and leaving the trail of it behind him wherever he went. His appearances were momentary only and his guises many. Here he was old and in the next place still a young man. He did not make gold in public on his own part, but caused it to be made by his disciples, with whom he left at parting a little of the powder of projection. Nothing is better established than the transmutations operated by these emissaries of Lascaris. M. Louis Figuier, in his learned work on the alchemists, does not question either their reality or their importance. Now, in physics above all, there in nothing more inexorable than facts, and it must be therefore concluded from these that the philosophical stone is not a matter of reverie, if the vast tradition of occultism. The ancient mythologies and the serious researches of great men in all ages are not otherwise sufficient to establish its real existence. 316 A modern chemist, who has not failed to publish his secret, has arrived at the extraction of gold from silver by a ruinous process, for the silver sacrificed by him does not produce in gold more than the tenth of its value, or thereabouts. Agrippa, who never attained the universal dissolvent, was notwithstanding more fortunate than our chemist, for he did obtain gold which was equivalent in value to the silver employed in his process and did not therefore lose his labor absolutely. 
if to employ it in research after the grand secrets of nature can be called loss. To set men upon researches which might lead them to the absolute philosophy by the attraction of gold, such would appear to have been the end of the propaganda connected with the name of Lascaris. Reflection on hermetic books would of necessity lead those who studied to a knowledge of the Kabbalah. As a fact, the initiates of the 18th century thought that their time had come, some for the foundation of a new hierarchy, others for the subversion of all authority and for setting on the summits of the social order the level of equality. The secret societies sent their scouts through the world to sound opinion, and at need awaken it. After Saint Germain and Lascaris came Mesmer, and Mesmer was succeeded by Cagliostro. But they were not all of the same school, Saint Germain was the ambassador of illuminated theosophists, while Lascaris represented the naturalists attached to the tradition of Hermes. Cagliostro was the agent of the Templars, and this is how he came to announce, in a circular address to all Masons in London, that the time had come to build the Temple of the Eternal. Like the Templars, Cagliostro was addicted to the practices of black magic and to the fatal science of evocations. He divined past and present, predicted things to come, wrought marvelous cures and pretended to make gold. He introduced a new rite under the name of Egyptian masonry and sought to restore the mysterious worship of Isis. Wearing a nemes like that of the Theban Sphinx, he presided in person over nocturnal assemblies, in chambers emblazoned with hieroglyphics and lighted by torches. His priestesses were young girls, whom he called doves, and he placed them in a condition of ecstasy by means of hydromancy in order to obtain oracles, water being an excellent conductor, a powerful reflector. And highly refracting medium for the astral light, as proved by sea and cloud mirages. It is obvious that Cagliostro was a successor of Mesmer and had the key of mediumistic phenomena. He was himself a medium, meaning that he was a man whose nervous organization was exceptionally impressionable, and to this he joined a fund of ingenuity in assurance, public exaggeration and the imagination, especially of women, supplying the rest. Cagliostro had an extravagant success, his bust was to be seen everywhere, inscribed, the divine Cagliostro. A reaction equivalent to the enthusiasm was of course to be foreseen. After having been a god, he became an intriguer and impostor, the debaucher of his wife, a scoundrel in fine, to whom the Roman Inquisition shewed grace by merely condemning him to perpetual imprisonment. The fact that his wife sold him lends color to the idea that previously he had sold his wife. 317 he was taken in a snare, his prosecution followed and his accusers published as much of the process as they pleased. The revolution came in the meantime, and everyone forgot Cagliostro. This adept is, however, by no means without importance in the history of magic. His seal is as significant as that of Solomon and attests his initiation into the highest secrets of science. As explained by the Kabbalistic letters of the names Akarat and Althotas, it expresses the chief characteristics of the great arcanum and the great work. It is a serpent pierced by an arrow, thus representing the letter Aleph, an image of the union between active and passive, spirit and life, will and light. The arrow is that of the antique Apollo, while the serpent is the python of fable, the green dragon of hermetic philosophy. The letter Aleph represents equilibrated unity. This pantacle is reproduced under various forms in the talismans of old magic, but occasionally the serpent is replaced by the peacock of Juno, the peacock with the royal head and the tail of many colors. This is an emblem of analyzed light, that bird of the magnum opus, the plumage of which is all sparkling with gold. At other times, instead of the emblazoned peacock, there is a white lamb, the young solar ram bearing the cross, as still seen in the armorial bearings of the city of Rouen. The peacock, the ram and the serpent have the same hieroglyphical meaning, that of the passive principle and the scepter of Juno. The cross and arrow signify the active principle, will, magical action, the coagulation of the dissolvent, the fixation of the volatile by projection and the penetration of earth by fire. The union of the two is the universal balance, the great arcanum, the great work, the equilibrium of Jachin and Boaz. The initials LPD, which accompany this figure, signify liberty, power, duty, and also light, proportion, density law, principle, and right. 
The Freemasons have changed the order of these initials, and in the form of L therefore D therefore P therefore 318 they render them as Liberté de Penser, Liberty of Thought, inscribing these on a symbolical bridge. But for those who are not initiated they substitute Liberté de Passer, Liberty of Passage. In the records of the prosecution of Cagliostro it is said that his examination elicited another meaning as follows, Lilia de True Pedibus, trample the lilies underfoot. And in support of this version may be cited a Masonic medal of the 16th or 17th century, depicting a branch of lilies severed by a sword, having these words on the excerpt, Talum dabit ultio mesum, revenge shall give this harvest. The name Akarat, assumed by Cagliostro, is written Kabbalistically thus, and expresses the triple unity, the unity of principle and beginning, the unity of life and perpetuity of regenerating movement. And, the unity of end in an absolute synthesis. The name Althotas, or that of Cagliostro's master, is composed of the word thought, with the syllables al and as, which, if read Kabbalistically, are sala, meaning messenger, or envoy. The name as a whole therefore signifies, thought, the messenger of the Egyptians, and such in effect was he whom Cagliostro recognized as his master above all others. 319. Another title adopted by Cagliostro was that of the Grand Koft, and his doctrine had the twofold object of moral and physical regeneration. The precepts of moral regeneration according to the Grand Koft were as follows, You shall go up Mount Sinai with Moses, you shall ascend Calvary, with Phaleg you shall climb Thaber, and shall stand on Carmel with Elias. You shall build your tabernacle on the summit of the mountain, it shall consist of three wings or divisions, but these shall be joined together and that in the center shall have three stories. The refectory shall be on the ground floor. Above it there shall be a circular chamber with twelve beds round the walls and one bed in the center, this shall be the place of sleep and dreams. The uppermost room shall be square, having four windows in each of the four quarters. And this shall be the room of light. There, and alone, you shall pray for forty days and sleep for forty nights in the dormitory of the twelve masters. Then shall you receive the signatures of the seven genii and the pentagram traced on a sheet of virgin parchment. It is the sign which no man knoweth, save he who receiveth it. It is the secret character inscribed on the white stone mentioned in the prophecy of the youngest of the twelve masters. Your spirit shall be illuminated by divine fire and your body shall become as pure as that of a child. Your penetration shall be without limits and great shall be also your power, you shall enter into that perfect repose which is the beginning of immortality, it shall be possible for you to say truly and apart from all pride, I am he who is. This enigma signifies that in order to attain moral regeneration, the transcendent Kabbalah must be studied, understood, and realized. The three chambers are the alliance of physical life, religious aspirations and philosophical light. The twelve masters are the great revealers, whose symbols must be understood, the signatures of the seven spirits mean the knowledge of the great arcanum. The whole is therefore allegorical, and it is no more a question of building a house of three stories than a temple at Jerusalem in masonry. Let us now turn to the secret of physical regeneration, to attain which, according to the occult prescription of the Grand Koft, a retreat of forty days, after the manner of a jubilee, must be made once in every fifty years. Beginning during the full moon of May, in the company of one faithful person only. It must be also a fast of forty days, drinking maydew, collected from sprouting corn with a cloth of pure white linen, and eating new and tender herbs. The repast should begin with a large glass of dew and end with a biscuit or crust of bread. There should be slight bleeding on the seventeenth day. Balm of Azoth 320 should then be taken morning and evening, beginning with a dose of six drops and increasing by two drops daily till the end of the thirty-second day. At the dawn which follows thereafter renew the slight bleeding, then take to your bed and remain in it till the end of the fortieth day. On the first awakening after the bleeding, take the first grain of universal medicine. A swoon of three hours will be followed by convulsions, sweats and much purging, necessitating a change both of bed and linen. At this stage a broth of lean beef must be taken, seasoned with rice, sage, valerian, vervain and balm. On the day following take the second grain of universal medicine, which is astral mercury combined with sulfur of gold. 
On the next day have a warm bath. On the thirty-sixth day drink a glass of Egyptian wine, and on the thirty-seventh take the third and last grain of universal medicine. A profound sleep will follow, during which the hair, teeth, nails and skin will be renewed. The prescription for the thirty-eighth day is another warm bath, steeping aromatic herbs in the water, of the same kind as those specified for the broth. On the thirty-ninth day drink ten drops of elixir of Akarat in two spoonsful of red wine. The work will be finished on the fortieth day, and the aged man will be renewed in youth. Point three twenty one. By means of this jubilary regimen, Cagliostro claimed to have lived for many centuries. It will be seen that it is a variation of the famous bath of immortality in use among the Menandrian Gnostics. Point three twenty two. The question is whether Cagliostro believed in it seriously. However, this may be, before his judges he shewed much firmness and presence of mind professing that he was a Catholic who honored the Pope as supreme chief of the religious hierarchy. On matters relating to the occult sciences he replied enigmatically and when accused of being absurd and incomprehensible he told his examiners that they had no ground of judgment, at which they were offended, and ordered him to enumerate the seven deadly sins. Having recited lust, avarice, envy, gluttony and sloth, they reminded him that he had omitted pride and anger. To this the accused retorted, Pardon me. I had not forgotten them, but I did not include them out of respect for yourselves and for fear of offending you further. He was condemned to death, which was afterwards commuted to perpetual imprisonment. In his dungeon Cagliostro asked to make his confession and himself designated the priest, who was a man of his own figure and stature. Point 323 The confessor visited him and was seen to take his departure at the end of a certain time. Some hours after the jailer entered the cell and found the body of a strangled man clothed in the garments of Cagliostro, but the priest himself was never seen again. Lovers of the marvelous declare that the Grand Coft is at this day in America, being the supreme and invisible pontiff of the believers in spirit rapping. 3. Prophecies of Kazat The school of unknown philosophers founded by Martinus de Pasquale and continued by L. C. De Saint Martin seems to have incorporated the last adepts of true initiation. Saint Martin was acquainted with the ancient key of the tarot, the mystery, that is to say, of sacred alphabets and hieratratic hieroglyphics. He has left many very curious pantacles which have never been engraved and of which we possess copies. One of them is the traditional key of the great work and is called by Saint Martin the key of hell, because it is that of riches. 324 The Martinists were the last Christians in the cohort of Illumins, and it was they who initiated the famous Kazat. We have said that during the 18th century a schism took place in Illuminism, on the one hand, the wardens of the traditions concerning nature and science wished to restore the hierarchy. There were others, on the contrary, who desired to level all things by disclosing the great arcanum, thus rendering the royalty and priesthood alike impossible in the world. Among the latter, some were ambitious and unscrupulous, seeking to erect a throne for themselves over the ruins of the world. Others were dupes and zanies. The true initiates beheld with dismay the launching of society towards the abyss, and they foresaw all the terrors of anarchy. That revolution which was destined at a later period to manifest before the dying genius of Vergniad under the somber figure of Saturn devouring his children had already shown itself fully armed in the prophetic dreams of Kazat. On a certain evening, when he was surrounded by blind instruments of the Jacobinism to come, he predicted the doom of all, for the strongest and weakest the scaffold, for the enthusiasts, suicide, and his prophecy. Which at the moment was rather like a somber jest, was destined to be realized amply. 325 As a fact, it was only the calculus of probabilities, and it proved strictly correct because it dealt with chances which had already become fatal consequences. La Harp, who was impressed by the prediction, amplified the details, to make it appear more marvelous. Point 326 He mentioned, for example, the exact number of times that a certain guest of the moment would draw the razor across his throat. Poetic license of this kind may be forgiven to the tellers of unusual stories, such adornments are of the substance of style and poetry rather than untruths. The gift of absolute liberty to men who are unequal by nature is an organization of social war. 
When those who should restrain the headlong instincts of the crowd are so mad as to unloose them, it does not need a great magician to foresee that they will be the first to be devoured. Since animal lusts are bound to prey upon one another until the appearance of a bold and skillful huntsman who will end them by shot and snare. Kazat foresaw Marat, as Marat in his turn foresaw reaction and a dictator. Kazat made his first appearance in public as the author of some literary trifles and it is said that he owed his initiation to the romance of Lodiable Amuro. There is no question that it is full of magical intuitions, and love, that supreme ordeal of life, is depicted in its pages under the true light of the doctrine of adeptship. Passion in a state of delirium and folly invincible for those who are slaves of imagination, physical love is but death in the guise of allurement, seeking to renew its harvest by means of birth. The physical Venus is death, painted and habited like a courtesan, Cupid also is a destroyer, like his mother, for whom he recruits victims. When the courtesan is satiated, death unmasks and calls in turn for its prey. This is why the church, which safeguards birth by sanctifying marriage, lays bare in their true colors the debaucheries which are mortal, by condemning without pity all the disorders of love. If she who is beloved is not indeed an angel, earning immortality by sacrifice to duty in the arms of him whom she loves, she is a stride who expends, exhausts, and slays him. Finally exposing herself before him in all the hideousness of her animal egoism. Woe to the victims of the Ludiable Amuro, thrice woe to those who are beguiled by the lascivious endearments of Biondetta. Speedily the gracious countenance of the girl will change into that camel's head which appears so tragically at the end of the romance of Kazat. According to the Kabbalists there are two queens of the Stryges in Sheol, one is Lilith, the mother of abortions, and the other is Nehama, fatal and murderous in her beauty. When a man is false to the spouse set apart for him by heaven, when he is abandoned to the disorders of a sterile passion, God withdraws his legitimate bride and delivers him to the embraces of Nehama who assumes at need all charms of maidenhood and of love. She turns the hearts of fathers, and at her instigation they abandon all the duties owing to their children, she brings married men to widowhood, while those who are consecrated to God she coerces into sacrilegious marriage. When she assumes the role of a wife she is, however, unmasked easily, for on her marriage day she appears in a state of baldness, that hair which is the veil of modesty for womanhood being forbidden her on this occasion. Later on she assumes airs of despair and disgust with existence, she preaches suicide, deserts him who cohabits with her, having first sealed him between the eyes with an infernal star. The Kabbalists say further that Nehama may become a mother but she never rears her children, as she gives them to her fatal sister to devour. These Kabbalistic allegories, which are found in the Hebrew book concerning the revolution of souls, included by Rosenroth in the collection of the Kabbalah de Nudida and otherwise met with in Talmudic commentaries on the soda must have been either known or divined by the author of Lodiable Amuro. 327 Hence we are told that after the publication of his novel, Kazat had a visit from an unknown person who was wrapped in a mantle, after the traditional manner of emissaries of the secret tribunal. The visitor made signs to Kazat which he failed to understand and then asked whether indeed he had not been initiated. On receiving a reply in the negative, the stranger assumed a less somber expression and then said, I perceive that you are not an unfaithful recipient of our secrets but rather a vessel of election prepared for knowledge. Do you wish to rule in reality over human passions and over impure spirits? Kazat displayed his curiosity, a long talk followed, it was the preface to other meetings, and the author of Lodiable Amuro was called to initiation at the end. He became a devout supporter of order and authority as a consequence and also a redoubtable enemy of anarchists. We have seen that, according to the symbolism of Cagliostro, there is a mountain into which those must go up who are on the quest of regeneration, this mountain is white with light, like Tabor, or red with fire and blood, like Sinai and Calvary. The Zohar says that there are two chromatic syntheses, one of them is white and is that of peace and moral light, the other, which is red, is that of war and material life. The Jacobins had plotted to unroll the standard of blood, and their altar was erected on the Red Mountain. Kazat was enrolled under the banner of light, and his mystical tabernacle was established on the White Mountain. That which was stained with blood triumphed for a moment, 
and Kazat was proscribed. The heroic girl who was his daughter saved him from the slaughter at the abbey. It so happened that the prefix denoting nobility was not attached to her name and she was spared therefore that horrible toast of fraternity which immortalized the filial piety of Mali. De Sombruel, who, to be vindicated from the charge of aristocracy, drank the health of her father in the blood-stained glass of cutthroats. Kazat was in a position to foretell his own death, because conscience compelled him to fight against anarchy even to the last. He obeyed it, was arrested for the second time and brought before the revolutionary tribunal as one condemned already. The president who pronounced his sentence added an allocution full of esteem and regret, pledging his victim to be worthy of himself unto the end and to die nobly as he had lived. Even in episodes of the tribunal, the revolution was a civil war and the brethren exchanged salutations as they condemned one another to death. The explanation is that there was the sincerity of conviction on both sides and both were entitled to respect. Whosoever dies for that which he thinks to be true is a hero even in his deception, and the anarchists of the ensanguined mountain were not only intrepid when dispatching others to the scaffold, but ascended it themselves without blanching. Let God and posterity be their judges. 4. The French Revolution once there was a man in the world who was soured on discovering that his disposition was cowardly and vicious, and he visited his consequent disgust on society at large. He was an ill-starred lover of nature, and nature in her wrath armed him with eloquence as with a scourge. He dared to plead the cause of ignorance in the face of science, of savagery in the face of civilization, of all low-life deeps in the face of all social heights. Instinctively the populace pelted this maniac, yet he was welcomed by the great and lionized by women. His success was so signal that, by revulsion, his hatred of humanity increased, and he ended in suicide as the final issue of his rage and disgust. After his death the world was shaken in its attempts to realize the dreams of Jean-Jacques Rousseau, and that silent conspiracy which ever since the murder of Jacques de Molay had sworn destruction to the social edifice. Inaugurated in Rue Plutrière, and in the very house where Rousseau had once lived, a Masonic lodge, with the fanatic of Geneva as its patron saint. This lodge became the center of the revolutionary propaganda, and thither came a prince of the blood royal, vowing destruction to the successors of Philip the Fair over the tomb of the Templar. It was the nobility of the eighteenth century which corrupted the people, the aristocracy of that period were seized with a mania for equality, which took its rise in the orgies of the Regency. Low company was kept for the pleasure of it and the court obtained diversion in talking the language of the slums. The archives of the Order of the Temple 328 testify that the regent was its grand master, that he had as his successors the Duc de Maine, the princes of Bourbon Condé and Bourbon Conti, and the Duc de Cosprissac. Cagliostro drew auxiliaries from the middle class to swell the membership of his Egyptian rite, everyone was eager to obey the secret and irresistible impulse which drove decadent civilization to its destruction. Events did not tarry, but as if impelled by hands unseen, they were heaped one upon another, after the manner foreseen by Kazat. The unfortunate Louis XVI was led by his worst enemies, who at once prearranged and stultified the paltry project of evasion which brought about the catastrophe of Varennes. Just as they had done with the orgy at Versailles and the massacre of August 10. On every side they compromised the king, at every turn they saved him from the fury of the people, to foment that fury and ensure the dire event which had been in preparation for centuries. A scaffold was essential to complete the revenge of the Templars. Amidst the pressure of civil war, the National Assembly suspended the powers of the king and assigned him the Luxembourg as his residence. But another and more secret assembly had ruled otherwise. A prison was to be the residence of the fallen monarch, and that prison was none other than the old palace of the Templars, which had survived, with keep and turrets, to await the royal victim doomed by inexorable memories. There he was duly interned, while the flower of French ecclesiasticism was either in exile or at the abbey. Artillery thundered on the Pont Neuf, menacing posters proclaimed that the country was in danger, unknown personages organized successive slaughters, while a hideous and gigantic being, covered with a long beard, was to be seen wheresoever there were priests to murder. Behold, he cried with a savage sneer, this is for the Albigenses and the Vaudois, 
this is for the Templars, this for Saint Bartholomew, and this for the exiles of the Savens. As one who was beside himself, he smote unceasingly, now with the saber and now with axe or club. Arms broke and were replaced in his hands. From head to foot he was clothed in blood, swearing with frightful blasphemies that in blood only he would wash. It was this man who proposed the toast of the nation to the angelical Mbli. De Sombruel. Meanwhile another angel prayed and wept in the tower of the temple, offering to God her own sufferings and those of two children to obtain pardon for the royalty of France. All the agonies and all the tears of that virgin martyr, the saintly Madame. Elizabeth, were necessary for the expiation of the imbecile joys which characterized courtesans like Madame de Pompadour and Madame du Barry. Jacobinism had received its distinctive name before the old church of the Jacobins was chosen as the headquarters of conspiracy, it was derived from the name Jacques, an ominous symbol and one which spelt revolution. French iconoclasts have always been called Jacques. That philosopher whose fatal celebrity prepared new jacqueries and was a peg on which to hang the sanguinary projects of Johannite schemers bore the name of Jean Jacques. While those who were prime movers in the French Revolution had sworn in secret the destruction of throne and altar over the tomb of Jacques de Molay. At the very moment when Louis XVI suffered under the acts of revolution, the man with a long beard, that wandering Jew, significant of vengeance and murder, ascended the scaffold and, confronting the appalled spectators, took the royal blood in both hands, casting it over the heads of the people, and crying with his terrible voice, People of France, I baptize you in the name of Jacques and of Liberty. 329 So ended half of the work, and it was henceforth against the Pope that the army of the Temple directed all its efforts. Spoliation of churches, profanation of sacred things, mock processions, inauguration of the cultus of reason in the metropolis of Paris, these were the signals in chief of the war in its new phase. The Pope was burnt in effigy at the Palais Royal, and presently the armies of the Republic prepared to march on Rome. Jacques de Molay and his companions were martyrs possibly, but their avengers dishonored their memory. Royalty was regenerated on the scaffold of Louis XVI, the Church triumphed in the captivity of Pius VI, when he was taken a prisoner to Valence, perishing of fatigue and suffering. But the unworthy successors of that old chivalry of the Temple perished in their turn, overwhelmed by disastrous victory. Signal abuses had characterized the ecclesiastical state and grave scandals were entailed by the misfortune of great riches. But when the riches melted away, the preeminent virtues returned. Such transitory disasters and such a spiritual triumph were predicted in the Apocalypse of St. Methodius, to which reference has been made already. We have a black letter copy of the work mentioned, printed in 1527 and embellished with amazing designs. Unworthy priests are shown in the act of casting the sacred elements to swine. The populace in a state of rebellion are seen assassinating the priests and breaking their sacramental vessels on their heads, the Pope appears as a prisoner in the hands of soldiers. A crowned knight raises with one hand the standard of France, and with the other draws his sword against Italy. Finally, two eagles are depicted on either side of a cock, bearing a crown on his head and a double fleur de lis on his breast. One of the eagles combines with griffins and unicorns to drive the vulture from his airy, and there is a host of other marvels. This singular book may be compared with an illustrated edition of the prophecies attributed to Abbe Joachim, the Calabrian, wherein are exhibited portraits of all the popes to come, with the allegorical signs of their respective pontificates. Down to the coming of Antichrist. These are strange chronicles of futurity, pictured as things of the past, they seem to intimate a succession of worlds wherein events are repeated, so that the provision of things to come is the evocation of shadows already lost in the past. V. Phenomena of Mediomania In the year 1772, a certain parishioner of St. Monde, named Loisot, being at church, believed that he saw an extraordinary person kneeling close by him. This was a very swarthy man, whose only garment was a pair of coarse worsted drawers. His beard was long, his hair woolly, and about his neck there was a ruddy circular scar. He carried a book, having the following inscription emblazoned in golden letters, Eki Agnes Dei. Loisot observed with astonishment that no one but himself seemed aware of this strange presence, but he finished his devotions and returned home, 
where the same personage was awaiting him. He drew nearer to ask who he was and what might his business be, when the fantastic visitor vanished. Loisot retired to bed in a fever and unable to sleep. The same night he found his room illuminated suddenly by a ruddy glow. He sprang up in bed, believing that the place was on fire, and then on a table in the very center of the room he saw a gold plate, wherein the head of his visitor was swimming in blood, encompassed by a red nimbus. The eyes rolled terribly, the mouth opened, a strange and hissing voice said, I await the heads of kings, the heads of the courtesans of kings, I await Herod and Herodias. The nimbus faded and the sick man saw no more. 330. Some days after he had recovered sufficiently to resume his usual occupations. As he was crossing the place Louis XV, a beggar accosted him and Loisot, without looking, threw a coin into his hat. Thank you, said the recipient, it is a king's head, but here, and he pointed towards the middle place of the thoroughfare, there will fall another, and it is that for which I am waiting. Loisot looked with astonishment towards the speaker and uttered a cry when he recognized the strange figure of his vision. Be silent, said the mendicant, they will take you for a fool, as no one but yourself can see me. You have recognized me, I know, and to you I confess that I am John Baptist, the precursor. I am here to predict the punishment which will befall the successors of Herod and the heirs of Caiaphas, you may repeat all that I tell you. From this time forward Loisot believed that St. John was present visibly at his side, almost from day to day. The vision spoke to him long and frequently on the woes which would befall France and the Church. Loisot related his vision to several persons, who were not only impressed but became seers on their own part. They formed among themselves a mystical society which met in great secrecy. It was their custom to sit in a circle, holding hands and awaiting communications in silence. This might continue for hours, and then the figure of the Baptist would appear in the midst of them. They fell, concurrently or successively, into the magnetic sleep and saw, passing before their eyes, the future scenes of the revolution, with the restoration which would come thereafter. The spiritual director of this sect or circle was a monk named Dom Girl, who became also their leader on the death of Loisot in 1788. 331 At the epoch of the revolution, however, having been won over by republican enthusiasm, Dom Girl was expelled by the other members, acting on the inspirations of their chief somnambulist, who was known as Sister Francoise André. He had a somnambulist of his own, and in a Parisian garret he followed what was then the new craft of a mesmerist. The seeress in question was an old and nearly blind woman, named Catherine Theot, she prophesied, and her predictions were realized. She cured many who were sick, and as her forecasts had a political cast invariably, the police of the Comite de Salat public were not slow in taking up the matter. One evening, Catherine Theot was in an ecstasy, surrounded by her adepts. Harkin, she exclaimed, I hear the sound of his footsteps, he is the mysterious chosen one of Providence, the angel of revolution, at once its savior and victim, king of ruins and regeneration. Do you see him? He draws nigh. He also has been encircled by the ruddy nimbus of the precursor, it is he who shall bear all crimes of those who are about to immolate him. Great are thy destinies, O thou who shalt close the abyss by casting thyself therein. Do you not behold him, adorned as if for a festival, carrying flowers in his hands, garlands which are crowns of his martyrdom? Then sobbing and melting into tears, how cruel is thine ordeal, my son! And how many ingrates shall curse thy memory through the ages! Rise up, and kneel down, he comes, the king comes, he is the king of bloody sacrifices. At this moment the door opened quickly. A man entered enveloped in a cloak and having his hat drawn over his eyes. Those who were present rose up. Catherine Theot stretched forth her arms towards the newcomer and said as her hands trembled, I knew that you must come, and I have awaited your coming. He who is at my right side, but unseen by you, shewed you to me yesterday, when an accusation was lodged against us. We are accused of conspiring for the king, and of a king I have indeed spoken. It is he whom the precursor reveals to me at this present moment, having a crown steeped in blood, and I know over whose head it is placed, your own, 
Maximilian. At this name the unknown started, as if a red-hot steel had entered his breast. He cast a swift and anxious glance about him, after which his expression became again impassable. What would you say? I fail to understand, he murmured in a short and abrupt manner. I would say, replied Catherine Theot, that the sun will beam brightly on that day when a man clothed in blue and bearing a scepter of flowers shall be for one moment the king and saviour of the world. I would say that you shall be great as Moses and as Orpheus, when, trampling on the head of that monster which is ready to devour you, you shall testify to headsmen and to victims that God is. Cease from this masking, Robespierre. Shew us rather without paling that valiant head which God is about to cast in the empty scale of his balance. The head of Louis XVI is heavy and yours can only be its counterpoise. Do you threaten? Asked Robespierre coldly, letting his cloak fall. Do you think by this juggling to startle my patriotism and influence my conscience? Do you hope by fanatical measures and old wives' fables to surprise my resolves as you have played the spy on my proceedings? You have looked for me, it would seem, and woe to you because you have looked. Since you compel the curiosity seeker, the anonymous visitor and observer to be Maximilian Robespierre, representative of the people, as such I denounce you to the Committee of Public Weal, and I shall proceed to have you arrested. Having said these words, Robespierre cast his cloak round his powdered head and walked stiffly to the door. No one dared to detain and none to address him. Catherine Theot clasped her hands and said, Respect his will, for he is king and pontiff of the new age. If he strike us, it is that God wills to strike us, lay bare the throat before the knife of providence. The initiates of Catherine Theot waited expecting their arrest through the whole night, but no one appeared. They separated on the following day. Two or three further days and nights elapsed, during which the members of the sect made no attempt at concealment. On the fifth day, Catherine Theot and those who were called her accomplices were denounced to the Jacobins by a secret enemy of Robespierre who insinuated skillfully to his hearers certain doubts against the tribune, a dictatorship had been mentioned. The very name of King was pronounced. Robespierre knew, and how came he to tolerate it? Robespierre shrugged his shoulders, but on the morrow Catherine Theot, Dom Girl and some others were arrested and consigned to those prisons which, once entered, opened only to furnish his daily task to the headsman. The story of Robespierre's interview with Catherine Theot had transpired, one knows not how point 332 already the counterpolice of the Thermidorians were watching the presumed dictator, whom they accused of mysticism because he believed in God. Robespierre notwithstanding was neither the friend nor enemy of the sect of New Johannites. He went to Catherine Theot that he might take account of phenomena, and dissatisfied at having been recognized he departed with threats which he did not attempt to fulfill. Those who converted the conventicle of the old monk and ecstatic into a sect of conspiracy hoped to derive from the proceeding a doubt or an opportunity for ridicule attaching to the reputation of the incorruptible Maximilian. The prophecy of Catherine Theot was fulfilled by the inauguration of the worship of the Supreme Being and the swift reaction of Thermidor. During this time the sect which had gathered about Sister André, whose revelations were recorded by a Sieur Duché, continued their visions and miracles. The fixed notion which they cherished was to preserve the legitimacy by the future reign of Louis the Seventeenth. Point three thirty three times out of number they saved and dreamed the poor little orphan of the temple and believed also that they had saved him literally. Old prophecies promised the throne of the lilies to a young man who had been once a captive. So Bridget, St. Hildegard, Bernard Tollard, Lichtenberger, all foretold a miraculous restoration after great disasters. 334 The Neo-Johannites were the interpreters and multipliers of these forecasts, a Louis XVII never failed them, they had seven or eight in succession, all perfectly authentic and not less perfectly preserved. It is to the influence of this sect that we owe at a later period the revelations of the peasant Martin de Gallardin and the prodigies of Vintras. In this magnetic circle, as in the assemblies of Quakers or Shakers of Great Britain, enthusiasm proved contagious, and was propagated from one to another. After the death of Sister André, second sight and the gift of prophecy devolved upon a certain Legros, who was at Charenton when Martin was incarcerated provisionally therein. 
he recognized a brother in the Bosoran peasant whom he had never seen. All these partisans, by force of willing Louis XVII created him in a certain sense. That is to say, they worked such efficacious hallucinations that mediums were made in the image and likeness of the magnetic type, and believing themselves to be literally the royal child escaped from the temple. They attracted all the reflections of this gentle and frail victim, so even that they remembered circumstances known only to the family of Louis XVI. This phenomenon, however incredible it may appear, is neither impossible nor unheard of. Paracelsus states that if, by an extraordinary effort of will, one can picture oneself as another person, one would know thereby and forth with the inmost thought of that person, and would attract his most secret memories. Often after a conversation which has placed us in thought affinity with a companion in conversation, we dream reminiscences of his private life. Among the simulators of Louis XVII we must therefore recognize some who were not impostors, but hallucinated beings, and among these last is the Swiss who is named Nondorf, a visionary like Swedenborg. One indeed so contagious in his conviction that old servants of the royal family have recognized him and cast themselves weeping at his feet. He bore the particular signs and scars of Louis XVII, he recounted his infancy with a startling appearance of truth and entered into minute details, which are decisive for private remembrances. His very features would have been those of the orphan of Louis XVI, had he really lived. One thing only in fine was wanting for the pretender to have been Louis the Seventeenth truly, and that is not to have been Nondorf. 335. Such was the contagious magnetic power of this deluded person that even his death did not undeceive any of the believers in his reign to come. We have seen one of the most convinced, to whom we timidly objected, when he spoke of the approaching restoration of what he called the true legitimacy, that his Louis the Seventeenth was dead. Is it then more difficult for God to raise him from death than it was for those who preceded us to save him from the temple? Such was the answer given us, and this with a smile so triumphant that almost it seemed disdainful. We had nothing to rejoin on our own part, but were rather compelled to bow in the presence of such a conviction. 6. The German Illuminati Germany is the native land of metaphysical mysticism and phantoms. A phantom itself of the old Roman Empire, it seems always to invoke the mighty shade of Hermon, consecrating in his honor the simulacrum of the captive eagles of Varus. The patriotism of young Germany is invariably that of the Germans in elder days. They have no thought of invading the laughing land of Italy, they accept the situation, as it stands, simply as a matter of revenge. But they would die a thousand times in the defense of their hearths and homes. They love their old castles, their old legends of the banks of the Rhine, they read with the uttermost patience the darksome treatises of their philosophy. They behold in the fogs of their sky and in the smoke of their pipes a thousand things inexpressible, by which they are initiated into the marvels of the other world. Long before there was any question of mediums and their evocations in America and France, Prussia had its Illuminati and seers, who had habitual communications with the dead. At Berlin, a great noble built a house destined for evocations. King Frederick William was very curious about all such mysteries and was often immured in this house with an adept named Steinert. His experiences were so signal that a state of exhaustion supervened and he had to be restored with drops of some magical elixir analogous to that of Cagliostro. There is a secret correspondence belonging to the reign in question which is cited by the Marquis de Luchet in his work against the Illuminati, and it contains a description of the dark chamber in which the evocations were performed. It was a square apartment, divided by a transparent veil, the magical furnace or altar of perfumes was erected in front of the veil and behind was a pedestal on which the spirit manifested. In his German work upon magic, Eckhart Schausen describes the whole of the fantastic apparatus, being a system of machines and operations by which imagination was helped to create the phantoms desired. Those who consulted the oracle being in a kind of waking somnambulism, comparable to the nervous excitement produced by opium or hashish. Those who are contented with the explanations given by the author just mentioned will regard the apparitions as magic lantern effects, but there is more in it assuredly than this. While the magic lantern was only an accessory instrument in the business and one in no sense necessary for the production of the phenomenon. 
The images of persons once known on earth and now called up by thought do not appear as reflections of colored glass, the pictures painted by a lantern do not speak, nor do they give answers to question on matters of conscience. The king of Prussia, to whom the house belonged, was well acquainted with all the apparatus and was not therefore duped by jugglery, as the author of the secret correspondence pretends. The natural means paved the way for the prodigy but did not perform the latter, and the things which occurred were of a kind to surprise and disturb the most inveterate skeptic. 336 Schroepfer, moreover made use of no magic lantern in no veil, but those who came to him drank a kind of punch which he prepared. The forms which then appeared by his mediation were like those of the American home, that is to say, partially materialized, and they caused a curious sensation in persons who sought to touch them. The experience was analogous to an electric disturbance, making the flesh creep, and there would have been no such sensation if people had moistened their hands before touching the apparition. Schroepfer acted in good faith, as does also the American home, he believed in the reality of the spirits evoked by him, and he killed himself when he began to doubt at point 337. Lavater, who also died violently, was utterly given over to evocations. He had two spirits at his command and belonged to a circle which cultivated catalepsy by the help of a harmonica. A magical chain was formed, a species of imbecile served as the spirit's interpreter and wrote under his control. 338 This spirit gave out that he was a Jewish Kabbalist who died before the birth of Jesus Christ, and the things which the medium recorded under his influence were worthy of Cahagnet somnambulists. 339 There was, for example, a revelation on sufferings in the life beyond. The communicating spirit stating that the soul of the Emperor Francis was compelled to calculate the number and exact condition of all the snail shells which may exist and have existed in the whole universe. He made known also that the true names of the three magi were not, as tradition tells us, Gaspar, Melchior and Balthasar, but on the contrary Vrazifarmian, Melchisedek and Baleothrasaran. It is like reading the names written by our modern process of table turning. The spirit also testified that he was himself doing penance for having threatened his father with the magical sword and that he felt disposed to make his friends a present of his portrait. Paper, paints and brushes were placed at his request behind a screen, he was then seen to design on the screen the outline of a small hand, a slight friction was audible on the paper. When it ceased everyone pressed forward and found rudely painted the likeness of an old rabbi vested in black, with a white ruffle over the shoulders and a black skullcap. A costume altogether eccentric for a personage who was anterior to Jesus Christ. The painting, for the rest, was smudged and ill-drawn, resembling the work of a child amusing himself by dobing with eyes shut. 340 The written instructions of the medium under the inspiration of Gabladon Vi in their obscurity with the characteristics of German metaphysicians. The attribute of majesty must not be conferred lightly, says this authority, for majesty is a derivation from mage, seeing that the magi were pontiffs and kings, they were therefore the primeval majesties. It is against the majesty of God that we offend when we sin mortally, we wound him as father, casting death into the sources of life. The fountain of the Father is light and life, that of the Son is blood and water. While the splendor of the Holy Spirit is fire and gold. We sin against the Father by falsehood, against the Son by hatred and against the Holy Spirit by debauchery, which is the work of death and destruction. The good Lavater received these communications like oracles and when he asked for some further illuminations, Gabladon proceeded as follows, the great revealer of mysteries shall come, and he will be born in the next century. The religion of the patriarchs will then be known on earth, it will explain to mankind the triad of Agen, Helion, Tetragrammaton, and the Saviour whose body is girt with a triangle shall be shown on the fourth step of the altar. The apex of the triangle will be red and the device of mystery thereon will be, Venite ad patres osphal. One of the auditors demanded the meaning of the last word, and the medium wrote as follows without other explanations, Alphas, M, Aphon, Eliphasmatis. Certain interpreters have concluded that the Magus whose advent was announced in the course of the 19th century would be named Maphon and would be the son of Eliphisma, but this reading may be somewhat speculative. There is nothing more dangerous than mysticism, for the mania which it begets baffles every combination of human wisdom. 
It is ever the fools who upset the world and that which great statesmen never foresee is the desperate work of a maniac. The architect of the Temple of Diana at Ephesus promised himself eternal glory, but he counted without Aerostratus. The Girondins did not foresee Marat. What is needed to alter the equilibrium of the world? Asked Pascal, on the subject of Cromwell. The answer is, a speck of gravel formed by chance in the entrails of a man. So do the great events come about through causes which in themselves are nothing. When any temple of civilization crashes down, it is always the work of a blind man, like Samson, who shakes the pillars thereof. Some wretched preacher, belonging to the dregs of the people, is suffering from insomnia and believes himself elected to deliver the world from Antichrist. Accordingly he stabs Henry IV and reveals to France in its consternation the name of Ravelac. The German thaumaturgists regarded Napoleon as the Apollyon mentioned in the Apocalypse and one of their neophytes, named Stabs, came forward to kill the military Atlas. Who at the given moment was carrying on his shoulders a world snatched from the chaos of anarchy. But that magnetic influence which the Emperor called his star was more potent than the fanatical impulse of the German occult circles. Stabs could not or dared not strike, Napoleon himself questioned him, he admired his resolution and courage. But, as he understood his own greatness, he would not detract from the new Sevilla by forgiving him, he shewed his estimation indeed by taking him seriously and allowing him to be shot. Carl Sand, who killed Kotzebue, was also an unfortunate derelict child of mysticism, misled by the secret societies, in which vengeance was sworn upon daggers. Kotzebue may have deserved cudgeling, but the weapon of sand reinstated and made him a martyr. It is indeed grand to perish as the enemy and victim of those who wreak vengeance by means of ambuscades and assassinations. The secret societies of Germany practiced rites which were less or more comparable to those of magic. In the Brotherhood of Mopsas, for example, the mysteries of the Sabbath and the secret reception of Templars were renewed in mitigated and almost humorous forms. The Baphometic goat was replaced by a dog, as if Hermanubis were substituted for Pan, or science for nature, the latter being an equivalent change, since nature is known solely by the intermediation of science. The two sexes were admitted by the Mopsas, as was the case at the Sabbath. The reception was accompanied by barkings and grimaces, and, as among the Templars, the neophyte was invited to take his choice between kissing the back parts of the devil, the Grand Master or the Mops, which was a small image of cardboard. Covered with silk, and representing a dog, called Mops in German. The salutation in question was the condition of reception and recalls that which was offered to the goat of Mendez in the initiations of the Sabbath. The Mopses took no pledges other than on their word of honor, which is the most sacred of all oaths for self-respecting people. Their meetings were occasions for dancing and festivity, again like those of the Sabbath, except that the ladies were clothed, and did not hang live cats from their girdles or eat little children, it was altogether a civilized Sabbath. 341. Magic had its epic in Germany and the Sabbath its great poet, the epic was the colossal drama of Faust, that completed Babel of human genius. Goethe was initiated into all mysteries of magical philosophy. In his youth he had even practiced the ceremonial part. The result of his daring experiments was to produce in him, for the time being, a profound disgust with life and a strong inclination towards death. As a fact, he accomplished his suicide, not by a literal act but in a book, he composed the romance of Werther, the fatal work which preaches death and has had so many proselytes. Then, victorious over discouragement and disgust, and having entered the serene realms of peace and truth, he wrote Faust. It is a magnificent commentary on one of the most beautiful episodes in the Gospel, the parable of the prodigal son. It is initiation into sin by rebellious science, into suffering by sin, into expiation and harmonious science by suffering. Human genius, represented by Faust, employs as its lackey the spirit of evil, who aspires to become master. It exhausts quickly all the delight that is attributed by imagination to unlawful love, it goes through orgies of folly. Then, drawn by the charm of sovereign beauty, it rises from the abyss of disillusion to the heights of abstraction and imperishable beauty. 
There Mephistopheles is at his ease no longer, the implacable laughter turns sad. Voltaire gives place to Chateaubriand. In proportion as the light manifests, the angel of darkness writhes and tosses, he is bound by celestial angels, he admires them against his will, he loves, weeps and is conquered. In the first part of the drama, we see Faust separated by violence from Margaret, the heavenly voices cry that she is saved, even as she is being led to execution. But can that Faust be lost who is always loved by Margaret? Is not his heart already espoused to heaven? The great work of redemption in virtue of solidarity moves on to its fulfillment. How should the victim ever be consoled for her sufferings, did she not convert her executioner? Is not forgiveness the revenge of the children of heaven? The love which has first reached the Empyrean draws science after it by sympathy, Christianity apprises in its admirable synthesis. The new Eve has washed the mark from the forehead of Cain with the blood of Abel, and she weeps with joy over her two children, who hold her in their joint embrace. To make room for the extension of heaven, hell, which has become useless, ceases. The problem of evil has found its definitive solution, and good, alone necessary and alone triumphant, shall reign henceforth eternally. Hereof is the glorious dream of the greatest of all poets, but the philosopher, by misfortune, forgets the laws of equilibrium. He would swallow up light in a shadowless splendor and motion in an absolute repose, which would signify cessation of life. So long as there is visible light, there will be shadow in proportion therewith. Repose will never be happiness, unless equilibrated by an analogous and contrary movement. So long as there shall be free benediction, blasphemy will remain possible, so long as heaven remains, a hell there will also be. It is the unchangeable law of nature and the eternal will of that justice whose other name is God. 7. Empire and Restoration Napoleon filled the world with wonders, and in that world was himself the greatest wonder of all. The Empress Josephine, his wife, curious and credulous as a creole, passed from enchantments to enchantments. A glory of this kind had, as we are told, been promised her by an old gypsy woman, and the folk of the countryside still believe that she was herself the emperor's good genius. As a fact, she was a sweet and modest counselor who would have saved him from many perils, had he always listened to her warnings, but he was impelled forward by fatality, or rather by providence. And that which was to befall him had been decreed beforehand. In a prophecy attributed to Saint Césaire but signed Jean de Vatigero, and found in the Liber Mirabilis, a collection of predictions printed in 1524-342 there are the following astonishing sentences. The churches shall be defiled and profaned, and the public worship suspended. The eagle shall take flight over the world and overcome many nations. The greatest prince and most august sovereign in all the West shall be put to rout after a supernatural defeat. A most noble prince shall be sent into captivity by his enemies and shall mourn in thinking of those who were devoted to him. Before peace is restored to France, the same events shall be repeated again and again. The eagle shall be crowned with a triple diadem, shall return victorious to his airy and shall leave it only to ascend into heaven. After predicting the spoliation of churches and the murder of priests, Nostradamus foretells the birth of an emperor in the vicinity of Italy and says that his reign will cost France a great outpouring of blood. While those who belong to him will betray him and charge him with the spilling of blood. An emperor shall be born near Italy. Who shall cost dear to the empire? They shall say, with what people he keepeth company. He shall be found less a prince than a butcher. From a simple soldier he shall come to have the supreme command. From a short gown he shall come to the long one. Valiant in arms, no worse man in the church. He shall vex the priests, as water doth a sponge. 343. This is to say that at the moment when the church experiences the greatest calamities, he will overwhelm the priests with benefits. In a collection of prophecies published in 1820, and of which we possess a copy, the following phrase occurs after a prediction concerning Napoleon I, and the nephew will accomplish that which the uncle failed to do. The Celebrated Mlee Lenormand had in her library a volume in boards with a parchment back, 
containing the treatise of Oliverius on prophecies, followed by ten manuscript pages, in which the reign of Napoleon and his downfall were announced formally. The CRS imparted the contents of this work to the Empress Josephine. Having mentioned MLLE Lenormand, a few further words may be added about this singular woman. She was stout and extremely plain, emphatic in talk, ludicrous in style, but a waking somnambulist of conspicuous lucidity. She was the fashionable seeress under the First Empire and the Restoration. There is nothing more wearisome than are her writings, but as a teller of fortunes by cards she was most successful. Cartomancy, as restored in France by Attila, is literally the questioning of fate by signs agreed on beforehand. These in combination with numbers suggest oracles to the medium, who is biologized by staring at them. The signs are drawn by chance, after having shuffled them slowly. They are arranged according to Kabbalistic numbers, and they respond invariably to the thoughts of those who question them, seriously and in good faith, for all of us carry a world of presentiments within us which any pretext will formulate. Susceptible and sensitive natures receive from us a magnetic shock which conveys to them the impression of our nervous state. The medium can then read our fears and hopes in ripples of water, forms of clouds, counters cast haphazard on the ground, in the marks made on a plate by the grouts of coffee, in the lottery of a card game, or in the tarot symbols. As an erudite Kabbalistic book, all combinations of which reveal the harmonies pre-existing between signs, letters, and numbers, the practical value of the tarot is truly and above all marvelous. But we cannot with impunity, by such means, extort from ourselves the secrets of our intimate communication with the universal light. The questioning of cards and tarots is a literal evocation, which cannot be performed apart from danger and crime. By evocations we compel our astral body to appear before us, in divination we force it to speak. We provide a body for our chimeras by so doing, and we make approximate reality of that future which will actually become ours when it is called up by power of the word and is embraced by faith. To acquire the habit of divination and of magnetic consultations is to make a compact with vertigo, and we have established already that vertigo is hell. MLLE Lenormand was infatuated with herself and with her art. She thought that the world could not go on without her and that she was necessary to the equilibrium of Europe. At the Congress of AIX La Chapelle, the CRS made her appearance with all her properties, did business at all the customs, and pestered all the authorities, so that they were compelled in a sense to concern themselves with her. She was truly the fly on the wheel, and what a fly! On her return she published her impressions with a frontispiece representing herself surrounded by all the powers, who consulted her and trembled in her presence. 344. The great events which had just come to pass in the world turned all minds towards mysticism, a religious reaction began and the royalties constituting the Holy Alliance felt the need of attaching their united scepters to the cross. The Emperor Alexander in particular believed that the hour was come for Holy Russia to convert the world to universal orthodoxy. The intriguing and turbulent sect of the saviors of Louis XVII sought to profit by this tendency for the foundation of a new priesthood, and it succeeded in introducing one of its seeresses to the notice of the Russian emperor. Madame Bouche was the name of this new Catherine Theot, but she was called Sister Salome by the sect. 345 She spent eighteen months at the imperial court and had many secret conferences with Alexander, but he had more of pious imagination than true enthusiasm, he delighted in the marvelous and pretended that it amused him. It came about that his confidence in this class of interests presented him with another prophetess, and Sister Salome was forgotten. Her successor was Madame de Crudner, an amiable coquette full of piety and virtue, who created but was not herself Valerie. 346 It was, however, her ambition to pass as the heroine of her own book, and when one of her intimate friends pressed her to identify the hero, she mentioned an eminent personality of that period. Ah then, said her friend, the catastrophe of your book is not in conformity with the facts, for the gentleman in question is not dead. But Madame de Crudner replied, Oh, my dear, he is little better than dead, and the retort was her fortune. The influence of Madame de Crudner on the somewhat weak mind of Alexander was strong enough to concern his advisers, he was often shut up with her in prayer, but in the end she was lost by excess of zeal. 
One day the emperor was taking leave of her when she threw herself before him, conjuring him not to go out and explaining how God had made known to her that he was in great danger, that there was a plot against his life. And that an assassin was concealed in the palace. The emperor was alarmed and summoned the guards, a search followed, and some poor wretch was ultimately discovered with a dagger. In confusion he finished by confessing that he had been introduced by Madame de Crudener herself. 347 Was it true, and had the lady played the part of Latude in the vicinity of Madame de Pompadour? Was it false, and, secreted by the emperor's enemies, was the man's mission, in the event of the murder failing, to destroy Madame de Crudener? Either way, the poor prophetess was lost, for the emperor, in his shame at being regarded as a dupe, sent her about her business without hearing her, and she had reason to think herself fortunate in escaping so easily. The little church of Louis XVII did not conclude that it was beaten by the disgrace of Madame Bouche, while in that of Madame de Crudener it beheld a divine punishment. The prophecies continued and were reinforced, as required, by miracles. In the reign of Louis XVIII they put forward a peasant of La Bossi, named Martin, 348 who declared that he had seen an angel. From the description which he gave the angel in question was in the guise of a lackey belonging to some good family. He had a long surtout, cut very close at the waist and of a yellow color, he was pale and thin, with a hat which was probably adorned with gold lace. The strange thing is that the seer managed to be taken seriously and obtained an interview with the king, furnishing one more instance of the resources in persistence and boldness. It is said that the king was astonished by revelations concerning his private life, in which there is nothing that is impossible or even of an extraordinary nature, now that the phenomena of magnetism are better authenticated and known. Moreover, Louis XVIII was sufficiently skeptical to be credulous. Doubt in the presence of existence and its harmonies, skepticism in the face of the eternal mathematics and immutable laws of life. By which divinity is manifested everywhere, this assuredly is the most imbecile of superstitions and the least excusable, as it is the most dangerous, of all credulities. Book 7. Magic in the Nineteenth Century, Zane. I. Magnetic Mystics and Materialists. The denial of the fundamental doctrine of Catholic religion, formulated so magnificently in the poem of Faust, had borne its fruits in the world. Morality deprived of its eternal sanction became doubtful and unsettled. A materialistic mystic turned about the system of Swedenborg to create on earth a paradise of attractions in proportion to destinies. By the word attractions Fourier understood the sensuous passions, and to these he promised an integral and absolute expansion. God, who is the supreme reason, marks such condemned doctrines with a terrible seal. The disciples of Fourier began by absurdity and ended in madness. 349. They believed seriously that the ocean would be presently transformed into an immeasurable bowl of lemonade. They believed also in the future creation of anti-lions and anti-serpents, in epistolary correspondence to be established between the planets. We forbear speaking of the famous tale, 32 feet in length, with which it is reported that the human species was to be adorned, because it would appear that they had the generosity to set this notion aside as, according to their master. A purely hypothetical question. To such absurdities does the denial of equilibrium lead? And at the bottom of all these follies there is more logic than would be thought. The same reason which necessitates suffering in humanity renders indispensable the bitterness of seawater. Grant the integral expansion of instincts, and you can no longer admit the existence of wild beasts. Endow man with the capacity of satisfying his appetites as the sum of all morality, and he will still have something to envy in orangutans and monkeys. To deny hell is also to deny heaven, seeing that, according to the most exalted interpretation of the great hermetic dogma, hell is the equilibrating reason of heaven, for harmony results from the analogy of contraries. Quat superius, sicket quat inferius. Superiority presupposes inferiority, the depth determines the height, and to fill up the valleys is to efface mountains. So also to take away shadows would be to destroy light, as this is only visible by the graduated contrast of darkness and day, and universal obscurity would be produced by all dazzling brilliance. 
The very existence of colors in light is due to the presence of shadow, it is the triple alliance of day and night, the luminous image of dogma, the light made shadow, as the Savior is the Word made man. All this rests on the same law, which is the first law of creation, the one absolute law of nature, being that of the distinction and harmonious balancing of opposing forces in universal equilibrium. That which has revolted public conscience is not the dogma of hell but its rash interpretation. Those barbarous dreams of the Middle Ages, those atrocious and obscene tortures, sculptured on the porticos of churches, that infamous cauldron for the cooking of human flesh which lives for ever, so that it may for ever suffer. While the elect are rejoiced by the smoke, all this is absurd and impious. But none of it belongs to the sacred doctrine of the Church. The cruelty attributed to God constitutes the most frightful of blasphemies, and it is precisely for this reason that evil is forever irremediable while the will of man rejects the divine goodness. God inflicts the tortures of reprobation on those who are damned only as He causes the death of the suicide. Work in order to possess, and you will be happy, so speaks the supreme justice to man. I would possess and enjoy without labor. You will then be a robber and will suffer. I will rebel. You will be broken and will suffer further. I will rebel forever. Then shall you suffer eternally. Such is the decree of the absolute reason and the sovereign justice, what can be answered here too by human pride and folly. Religion has no greater enemy than unbridled mysticism, which mistakes its feverish visions for divine revelations. It is not the theologians who have created the devil's empire, but the false devotees and sorcerers. To believe a vision of the brain rather than the authority of public reason or piety has been ever the beginning of heresy in religion and of folly in the order of human philosophy, a fool would not be a fool if he believed in the reason of others. Visions have never been wanting to piety in revolt, nor chimeras to reason which excommunicates and banishes itself. From this point of view, magnetism has its dangers assuredly, for the state which it induces leads to hallucination as easily as to lucid intuition. We are dealing in this chapter, on the one hand, with mystic magnetisers, with materialistic magnetisers on the other hand, and we would warn them in the name of science concerning the risks which they run. Divinations, magnetic experiences and evocations belong to one and the same order of phenomena, being those which cannot be misemployed without danger to reason and life. Some thirty or forty years ago a choirmaster of Notre Dame, who, for the rest, was an exceedingly pious and estimable man, became infatuated with mesmerism and gave himself up to its experiences. He also devoted more time than was reasonable to the study of the mystics, and above all the vertiginous Swedenborg. Mental exhaustion followed, and as it was accompanied by sleeplessness, he used to rise and continue his studies. If this failed to quiet the restlessness of his brain, he took the key of the church, entered it by the Port Rouge, repaired to the choir which was lighted only by the feeble lamp of the high altar. Took refuge in his stall and there remained till morning, immersed in prayers and profound meditation. There came a night when eternal damnation formed the subject of his reflections, in connection with the menacing doctrine of the small number of the elect. He was unable to reconcile such rigorous exclusion of the majority with the infinite goodness of that God who, according to Holy Scripture, wills the salvation of all and their attainment of truth. He thought also of those fiery torments which the most cruel of earthly tyrants would not, were it possible, inflict for one day only on his worst enemy. Doubt entered his heart by all its avenues, and he had recourse to the conciliating explanations of theology. The Church does not define the fire of hell. According to the Gospel it is eternal, but it is nowhere written that the greater number of men are destined to suffer eternally. Many of the condemned may undergo only the privation of God. Above all the Church forbids absolutely the assumption of individual damnation. Pagans can be saved by the baptism of desire, scandalous sinners by sudden and perfect contrition, and in fine we must hope for all, as we must pray also for all, save one only. Being he of whom the Saviour said that it would have been better for him had that man never been born. The last thought brought the choirmaster to a pause, and it came upon him suddenly that a single man was thus carrying officially the burden of condemnation for centuries, that Judas Iscariot. 
who is the subject of reference in the passage of Scripture quoted, after so far repenting his crime that he died because of it, had become the scapegoat of humanity, the Atlas of Hell, the Prometheus of damnation. Yet he it was whom the Saviour on the threshold of death had termed his friend. The choirmaster's eyes filled with tears, redemption seemed ineffectual if it failed to save Judas. For him and for him only, he exclaimed in his exaltation, would I have died a second time, had I been the Saviour. Yet is not Jesus Christ a thousand times better than I am, and what must he then be doing in heaven, if I am weeping on earth for his hapless apostle? What he is doing, added the priest, his exaltation increasing, is to pity me and console me. I feel it. He is telling my heart that the pariah of the gospel is saved and that he will become, by the long malediction which still weighs upon his memory, the Redeemer of all pariahs. Now, if it be so, a new gospel must be proclaimed to the world, and it will be one of infinite, universal mercy, in the name of the regenerated Judas. But I am astray, I am a heretic, a reprobate, and yet, no, for I am sincere. Then clasping his hands fervently, the choirmaster added, My God, vouchsafe me that which thou didst not refuse unto faith of old and which thou dost not refuse now, a miracle to convince and reassure me. A miracle as the testimony of a new mission. The enthusiast then rose and in that silence of the night which is so formidable at the foot of altars, in the vastness of the mute and darksome church, he pronounced the following evocation in loud tones. But slowly and solemnly, thou who hast been cursed for eighteen centuries, thou for whom I weep, for thou dost seem to have taken hell solely unto thyself, so that heaven may be left for us. Thou, unfortunate Judas, if it be true that the blood of thy master has purified thee, so that thou art saved indeed, come and lay thy hands upon me, for the priesthood of mercy and love. While the echo of these words was still murmuring through the affrighted arches, the choirmaster rose up, crossed the choir and knelt under the lamp before the high altar. He tells us, for the account is related by himself, that he felt positively and really two warm and living hands placed upon his head, as bishops imposed them on the day of ordination. He was not sleeping or swooning and he felt them. It was a real contact which lasted for several minutes. He became certain that God had heard him, that a miracle had been performed, new duties had been imposed, and that a new life was for him begun, from tomorrow he must be a new man. But on the morrow the unhappy choirmaster was mad. The dream of a heaven without hell, the dream of Faust has made other victims innumerable in this hapless century of doubt and egoism, which has only succeeded on its own part in the realization of a hell without a heaven. God himself has become of no effect in a system where all is permissible, where all things count for good. Men who have reached the point where they fear no longer a supreme judge, find it easy to dispense with that God of simple folk, who is less of a God in reality than the simple folk themselves. The fools, who vaunt themselves as conquerors of the devil, end by making themselves gods. Our age is above all that of these pseudo-divine mummers, and we have known all grades of them. The god Gano, a good and too poetic nature, who would have given his shirt to the poor, who reinstated thieves, who admired Lassenaire, and who would not have hurt a fly. The god Chino, a dealer in buttons in the Rue Croix de Petit Champs, a visionary like Swedenborg, and recording his inspirations in the style of Jeanet. 350 The god Turel, an excellent personage who deified woman and decided that Adam had been extracted from Eve. The god Auguste Kant, who preserved the Catholic religion intact with two only exceptions, being the existence of God and the immortality of the soul. The god Ronsky, he being a true scholar, who had the glory and the happiness to rediscover the first theorems of the Kabbalah, and who, having sold their communication for 150,000 francs to a wealthy imbecile named Arson, has borne witness in one of his most serious works that the said Arson, having refused to pay him in full, has become actually and literally the beast of the apocalypse. With a view of enforcing payment, Ronsky published a pamphlet entitled Yes or No, that is to say, Have you or have you not, Yes or No, purchased from me for 150,000 francs my discovery of the Absolute. Lest we should be accused of injustice towards one whose works have proved useful to ourselves, 
and whose eulogium has been pronounced in our former publications, we will give verbatim the passage in Ronsky's Reform of Philosophy, p. 512, which calls the attention of an indifferent universe to the pamphlet above mentioned. It will also offer a curious specimen of the style adopted by this merchant in the Absolute. This fact of the discovery of the Absolute, against which people have appeared to rebel so strongly, has already been established undeniably by means of a great scandal, that of the famous yes or no. Not less decisive by the brilliant victory of truth which followed therefrom than remarkable by the sudden manifestation of the symbolic being foreshadowed in the Apocalypse, the monster of creation who bears the name Mystery on his forehead. And who on this occasion, fearing to be mortally wounded, can no longer hide his hideous contortions in darkness but comes through the medium of newspapers and by other modes of publicity to expose in the open day his infernal rage and the height of his imposture, and it is good to know that this unfortunate arson, here accused, had already expended on the hierophant some forty or fifty thousand francs. We have attained after Ronsky that absolute which he sold so dearly, and we have given it without price to our readers, for truth is due to the world, and none has the right to appropriate or turn it into trade and merchandise. May this one act of justice atone for the error of a man who perished in a condition approaching want after having worked so hard, though not indeed for science. But to enrich himself by means of knowledge that he may have been unworthy to understand or to possess. 351. 2. Hallucinations. A root of ambition or cupidity is found invariably beneath the fanaticism of all the sects. Christ Jesus himself reprimanded often and severely those of his disciples who cleaved to him, during the days of his privations and exile in his own land. With the hope that they would come into a kingdom wherein they would occupy the seats of the mighty. The more egregious the expectations are, the more they inveigle some imaginations, and people are then prepared to pay for the felicity of hope with their whole purse and indeed their whole personality. It is thus that the god Ronsky ruined those imbeciles to whom he promised the absolute. It is thus that the god Auguste Kant drew an annuity of six thousand francs at the expense of his worshippers, among whom he had distributed fantastic dignities in advance, to become realizable when his doctrine should have conquered the world. It is thus that certain mediums draw money from innumerable dupes by promising them treasures which the spirits always make away with. Some of these impostors really believe in their promises, and it is these precisely who are the most unwearying and the boldest in their intrigues. Money, miracles, prophecies, none of these fail them, because theirs is that absolute of will and action which really works wonders, so that they are magicians without knowing it. From this point of view, that sect which may be termed the saviors of Louis XVII belongs to the history of magic. The mania of these people is so contagious that it draws within the circle of their belief even those who have come forward to combat them. They procure the most important and rare documents, collect the most exceptional testimonies, evoke forgotten memories, command the army of dreams, ensure the apparition of angels to Martin, of blood to Rose Tamasier. Of an angel in tatters to Eugene Vintras. The last history is curious on account or its extraordinary consequences, and we shall therefore recite it. In 1839, the saviors of Louis XVII, who had filled the almanacs with prophecies for 1840, seemed to have assumed that if the whole world could be made to expect a revolution, that revolution would not fail to be accomplished. But having no longer their prophet Martin, they set about to secure another. Some of their most zealous agents were then in Normandy, of which the pretended Louis XVII claimed to be Duke. They cast their eyes on a devout laborer, with an excitable but weak brain, and they planned the following device. They framed a letter addressed to the prince, meaning the pretender, filled it with emphatic promises concerning the reign to come, in combination with mystical expressions calculated to influence a person of feeble mentality. And then arranged that it should come into the hands of the peasant in question, who was named Eugene Vintras, under circumstances as to which he may be left to speak for himself. August 6, 1839. Towards nine o'clock I was occupied in writing, when there was a knock at the door of the room in which I sat, and supposing that it was a workman who came on business, I said rather brusquely, Come in. Much to my astonishment, in place of the expected workman, 
I saw an old man in rags. I asked merely what he wanted. He answered with much tranquility, Don't disturb yourself, Pierre Michel. Now, these names are never used in addressing me, for I am known everywhere as Eugene, and even in signing documents I do not make use of my first names. I was conscious of a certain emotion at the old man's answer, and this increased when he said, I am utterly tired, and wherever I appear they treat me with disdain, or as a thief. The words alarmed me considerably, though they were spoken in a saddened and even a woeful tone. I arose and placed a ten-sous piece in his hand, saying, I do not take you for that, my good man, and while speaking, I made him understand that I wished to see him out. He received it in silence but turned his back with a pained air. No sooner had he set foot on the last step than I shut the door and locked it. I did not hear him go down, so I called a workman and told him to come up to my room. Under some business pretext, I was wishing him to search with me all the possible places which might conceal my old man, whom I had not seen go out. The workman came accordingly. I left the room in his company, again locking my door. I hunted through all the nooks and corners, but saw nothing. I was about to enter the factory when I heard on a sudden the bell ringing for mass and felt glad that, notwithstanding the disturbance, I could assist at the sacred ceremony. I ran back to my room to obtain a prayer book and, on the table where I had been writing, I found a letter addressed to Madame de Jenner's in London, it was written and signed by M. Paul de Montfleury of Cannes, and embodied a refutation of heresy, together with a profession of orthodox faith. The address notwithstanding, this letter was intended to place before the Duke of Normandy the most important truths of our holy Catholic, Apostolic and Roman religion. On the document was laid the ten sous piece which I had given to the old man. In another communication, Pierre Michel admits that the face of his visitor was not unknown to him, but that he was struck with strange fear by his sudden appearance, that he barred and barricaded the door when he went out and listened a long time. Hoping to hear him go down. As Vintras heard nothing, there is no doubt that the mendicant took off his shoes so that he might descend, making no noise. Vintras ran to the window but did not see him depart, the explanation being that he had done so some time previously. Our witness, in the end, is upset, calls for help, looks everywhere, finally coming across the letter which he was meant to read, but it is for him evidently a letter fallen from heaven. Behold Vintras, devoted henceforth to Louis XVII, behold him also a visionary for the rest of his days, as the apparition of the old mendicant never quits him henceforward. Then seeing that he addressed Vintras as Pierre Michel, the latter regards him as the Archangel Michael, by an association of ideas which is analogous to that of dreams. 352 The deluded supporters of Louis XVII had divined, with the second sight of maniacs, the right moment for impressing the feeble wits of Vintras so as to make him by a single experience at once an illumin and a prophet. The sect of Louis XVII consists more especially of persons belonging to the service of the legitimate royalty, and when Vintras became their medium. He was the faithful mirror of their imaginations filled with Romanesque memories and obsolete mysticism. In the visions of the new prophet there were everywhere lilies steeped in blood, 353 angels habited like knights, saints disguised as troubadours. Thereafter came hosts affixed on blue silk. Vintras had bloody sweats, his blood appeared on hosts, where it pictured hearts with inscriptions in the handwriting and spelling of Vintras. Empty chalices were filled suddenly with wine, and where the wine fell the stains were like those of blood. The initiates believed that they heard delightful music and breathed unknown perfumes. Priests, invited to witness the prodigies, were carried away in the current of enthusiasm. One of them, from the Diocese of Tours, an old and venerable ecclesiastic, left his cure to follow the prophet. 354 We have personally seen this priest. He has narrated the marvels of Vintras with the most perfect accent of conviction, he has shown us hosts intincted with blood in a most inexplicable manner. He has communicated to us copies of official proceedings signed by more than fifty witnesses, all honorable persons, occupying positions in the world, artists, physicians, lawyers, a chevalier de Rezac and a duchesse d'Armail. Doctors have analyzed the crimson fluid which flowed from the hosts and have certified that it was human blood, 
the very enemies of Vintras, and he has cruel enemies, do not dispute the miracles, but refer them to the devil. Now, said the Abbe Chavos, the priest of Turin whom we have mentioned, can you tolerate the notion of the demon falsifying the blood of Christ Jesus on hosts which have been regularly consecrated? Abbe Chavos is a real priest, and the signs in question appeared in hosts which had been hallowed by him. This notwithstanding, the sect of Vintras is anarchic and absurd, and God would not therefore perform miracles in its favor. There remains the natural explanation of such phenomena, and in the course of the present work it has been indicated sufficiently to make further development needless. Vintras, whom his partisans represent as a new Christ, has also had his Iscariots, two members of the sect, a certain Gazzoli and another named Alexander Geoffroy, published the most scandalous revelations against him. 355 According to them, the devotees of Tilly Sursols, which was the place of their residence, were given over to the most obscene practices. They celebrated in their private chapel, which they termed the upper chamber, sacrilegious masses, at which the elect assisted in a state of complete nudity. At a given moment all present fell into a paroxysm, and with tears and cries of, love, love, they cast themselves into each other's arms, the rest we may be permitted to suppress. It was like the orgies of the old Gnostics, but without even taking the precaution to extinguish the lights. Alexander Geoffroy testifies that Vintras initiated him into a kind of prayer which consisted in the monstrous act of Onan, committed at the foot of the altar, but here the accuser is too odious to be believed on his own word. Abbe Chavos, to whom we mentioned these infamous impeachments, explained that they must be attributed to the hatred of two men who had been expelled from the association for having been guilty on their own part of the acts which they attributed to Vintras. However it may be, moral disorders engender naturally those of a physical kind, and abnormal excitements of the nervous system produce almost invariably eccentric irregularities in morals, if therefore Vintras is innocent. He might have been and may yet be guilty. His sect was condemned formally by Gregory XVI in his brief, dated November 8, 1843. We append a specimen of the style which this Illumin adopted. He is a man without education and his bombastic writings swarm with grammatical errors. Sleep, sleep, ye indolent mortals, rest, and still rest on your soft couches, smile at your dreams of festivals and grandeurs. The angel of the covenant has come down on your mountains, he has written his name even in the cups of your flowers. The rings on his feet have touched the rivers which are your pride and hope, the oaks of your forests have borrowed the tincture of a new morning from the radiance of his brow, the sea has made answer to his glance with a yearning leap. She has gone before him, prostrate yourselves upon the earth and be not alarmed at the continuous sound heard in the graves beneath. Sleep, and still sleep. He is engraving his name on the high hills. He is calling on time to speed his ship, and I have seen the oldest of the old smile at him. Sleep therefore and sleep, Elias, in the west, sets a cross at the gate of the temple, he seals it with fire and with the steel of a dagger. Still the temple, and still fire and dagger. It is strange assuredly how the fools reflect one another, all fanaticisms interweave their inspirations and the prophet of Louis XVII is here an echo of the vengeance cry of the Templars. It is true that Vintras does not hold himself responsible for what he writes, this is how he speaks on the subject. If my mind counted for anything in these condemned works, I should bow my head and fear would possess my soul. But the work is not my work, and I have had no concurrence therein either by research or desire. Calm is within me, my couch knows no vigils, watches have not wearied my eyes, my sleep is pure, as when God first gave it. I can say to my God with a free heart, Custodi anima miam et arumi, non arabescum, quonium spiravi in te. Another reputed reformer, he who posed as the messiah of prisons and the scaffold, namely, Lassenaire, with whom we do not assuredly seek to compare Vintras, wrote thus in his prison, as a chaste and pure virgin, I wake and I sleep. Ever in dreams of love. Who shall teach me the meaning of remorse? The argument of Vintras, in order to legalize his inspiration, is not therefore conclusive, for it has also served Lassenaire, to excuse and even legitimize not only reveries but crimes. Condemned by the Pope, 
the sect of Tilly Sersoles condemned the Pope in their turn, and Vintras, on his private warrant, constituted himself sovereign pontiff. The shape of his priestly vestments was revealed to him. He wears a golden diadem, having an Indian lingam over the forehead. He is vested in a purple robe and carries a magical scepter terminated by a hand, the fingers of which are closed excepting the thumb and little finger, being those consecrated to Venus and Mercury, emblematic of the antique hermaphrodite. The emblem of the old ceremonial orgies and the obscene pageants of the Sabbath. So do the memories and reflections of black magic, transmitted by the astral light, connect the mysteries of India and the profane worship of Baphomet with the ecstasies of this contagious being, whose infirmary is at London. And who continues there to make proselytes and victims. 356. The exaltation of the unfortunate prophet is by no means exempt from terrors and remorse, whatever he may have alleged to the contrary, and mournful confessions escape him from time to time. An example occurs in a letter written to one of his most intimate friends. I am always expecting new torments. Tomorrow the Verger family will come, and I shall behold in their faces the purity of their soul manifested in their joy of spirit. It will recall my past happiness, names will be mentioned which I pronounced lovingly myself in days not far away. That which will be a delight for others will bring me new tortures. I shall sit at the table, and whilst my heart is pierced with a sword, I shall have to smile. Oh, if perchance those terrible words which I have heard were not eternal, I might still embrace my cruel torment. Pardon, most dear, I cannot live without loving God. Listen, if your human charity permits you, as minister of the living God, I do not protest. He whom your master has spewed out of his mouth must be anathematized by you, on the night of Monday, being May 17 or 18, a frightful dream struck a mortal blow at soul and body alike. I was at St. Pake's, and there was no one in the house, though the doors were open. I had ascended hurriedly to the holy chapel and was about to open the door when I saw emblazoned thereon in characters of fire, Dare not to enter this place, thou whom I have spewed from my mouth. I could not retreat, I fell down overcome on the first step, and you can judge of my terror when I saw on every side a vast and deep abyss. With hideous monsters therein who hailed me as their brother. The thought came to me at that moment that the holy archangel also once called me his brother. What a difference! His salutation caused my soul to leap with the most intense joy, and at theirs I writhed in convulsions similar to those which they had experienced through the power with which God endowed my cross of grace at their apparition on April 28 last. I tried to cling to something, so that I might not fall into the bottomless gulf. I turned to the Mother of God, the Divine Mary, and called on her to help me. She was deaf to my voice. During all this time I continued writhing, leaving strips of my skin on the rugged points which bordered this terrible abyss. Suddenly whirlpools of flame rose towards me from that depth wherein I was about to fall. I heard yells of ferocious joy and could pray no longer, when a voice more terrific than long echoes of thunder in a violent tempest filled my ears, uttering these words, You think to overcome me but it is you who are conquered. I have taught you to be humble after my manner. Come, taste of my sweetness, be numbered among my elect, and learn also to know the tyrant of heaven, join with us in uttering blasphemies and imprecations against him. All else is useless, so far as you are concerned. Then after a scream of laughter the voice added, Behold Mary, her whom you called your shield against us, behold her gracious smile and listen to her gentle voice. Dear friend, I saw her above the abyss. Her eyes of celestial blue were filled with fire, her red lips were violet, her mild and divine voice had become hard and terrible, and like thunderbolt she hurled these words at me, writhe, proud one, in those fiery regions inhabited by demons. All my blood flowed back to my heart, it seemed that the hour had struck wherein an earthly hell was to replace the hell that is eternal, I could still utter a few words of the Ave, Maria. How the time passed I knew not, but on returning the servant was asleep and said that it was late. Oh, if only I revealed to the enemies of the work of mercy that which passes within me, would they not cry victory? They would say that here indeed was evidence of monomania. Would God that it were so, for I should have less to lament. 
and yet fear nothing. If God will not hear my voice when it pleads my own cause, I will pray Him to double my sufferings, on condition that He hides them from my enemies. Here triumphant hallucination reaches the point of the sublime. Vintras consents to be damned, provided he is not classed as a fool. It is the last instinct of reason's inestimable value, surviving reason itself. The drunken man is afraid only of being regarded as drunk. The monomaniac chooses death rather than admit his delirium. The explanation is that, according to the beautiful sentence of Sebes, already quoted, there is only one good desirable for man. It is that wisdom which is the practice of reason, there is also one only true and supreme misfortune to dread, which is madness. 3. Mesmerists and Somnambulists The Church in its great wisdom forbids us to consult oracles and to violate by indiscreet curiosity the secrets of futurity. In our day the voice of the Church is no longer heeded. The people go back to diviners and pythonesses, the somnambulists have become prophets for those who believe no longer in the Gospel precepts. It is not realized that preoccupation over a predicted event suppresses our freedom in a sense and paralyzes our means of defense, by consulting magic, to foresee future events, we give earnests to fatality. The somnambulists are the sibyls of our epoch, as the sibyls were somnambulists of antiquity. Happy are those cairns who do not place their credulity at the service of immoral or senseless magnetists. For by the very fact of their friendly consultations they place themselves in communion with the immorality or folly of those who inspire the oracle. The business of the mesmerist is easy and his dupes are manifold. Among those who are devoted to magnetism it is therefore important to know who are in earnest. Among these, M. Le Baron du Potet must be placed in the front rank, and his conscientious work has already done much to advance the science of Mesmer. He has opened at Paris a practical school of magnetism, to which the public is admitted for instruction in the processes and verification of the phenomena obtained. Baron du Potet is of an exceptional and highly intuitive nature. Like all our contemporaries, including the most instructed, he knows nothing of the Kabbalah and its mysteries, but magnetism has notwithstanding revealed to him the science of magic, and as it is still dread in his eyes. He has concealed that which he has found, even while feeling it necessary to reveal it. The book which he has written on the subject is sold only to his adepts and then under the seal absolute of secrecy.357 we have entered into no bond with M. Du Potet, but we shall reserve his secret out of respect for the convictions of a hierophant. It is sufficient to say that his work is the most remarkable of all products of pure intuition. We do not regard it as dangerous, because the writer indicates forces without being precise as to their use. He is aware that we can do good or evil, can destroy or save by means of magnetic processes, but the nature of these is not clearly and practically put forward, on which we offer him our felicitations. For the right of life and death presupposes a divine sovereignty, and we should regard its possessor as unworthy if he consented to sell it, in what manner soever. M. Du Potet establishes triumphantly the existence of that universal light wherein lucids perceive all images and all reflections of thought. He assists the vital projection of this light by means of an absorbent apparatus which he calls the magic mirror, it is simply a circle or square covered with powdered charcoal, finely sifted. In this negative space, the combined light projected by the magnetic subject and the operator soon tinges and realizes the forms corresponding to their nervous impressions. The somnambulist sees manifested therein all dreams of opium and hashish, and if he were not distracted from the spectacle convulsions would follow. The phenomena are analogous to those of hydromancy as practiced by Cagliostro. The process of staring at water dazzles and troubles the sight, the fatigue of the eye, in its turn, favors hallucinations of the brain. Cagliostro sought to secure for his experiments virgin subjects in a state of perfect innocence, so as to set aside interference due to nervous divagations occasioned by erotic reminiscences. Dupotet's magic mirror is perhaps more fatiguing for the nervous system as a whole, but the dazzlements of hydromancy would have a more dangerous effect upon the brain. 358. M. Dupotet is one of those deeply convinced men who suffer bravely the disdain of science and the prejudgment of opinion, 
repeating beneath his breath the profession of secret faith cherished by Galileo, per S.I. Mov. It has been discovered quite recently that the tables turn, as the earth itself turns, and that human magnetization imparts to portable articles, made subject to the influence of mediums, a specific movement of rotation. Objects of extraordinary weight can be lifted and transported through space by this force, for weight exists only by reason of equilibrium between the two forces of the astral light. Augment the action of one of them and the other will give way immediately. Now, if the nervous apparatus indraws and expels this light, rendering it positive or negative according to the personal superexcitation of the subject, all inert bodies submitted to its action and impregnated with its life will become lighter or heavier. Following the flux and reflux of the light which, in the new equilibrium of its movement, draws porous bodies and non-conductors about a living center, as planets in space are drawn, balanced and gravitate about their sun. This eccentric power of attraction or projection supposes invariably a diseased condition in the person who is the subject thereof, the mediums are all eccentric and badly equilibrated beings. Mediomania supposes or occasions a sequence of other nervous manias, fixed notions, deordinated appetites, disorderly erotomania, tendencies to murder or suicide. Among persons so affected moral responsibility seems to exist no more. They do evil with good as their motive, they shed tears of emotion in a church and may be surprised at bacchanalian orgies. They have a way of explaining everything, by the devil or the spirits which obsess and carry them away. What would you have of them? They live no more in themselves, some mysterious creature animates them and acts in their place, this being is named, legion. The reiterated efforts of a healthy person to develop mediumistic faculties cause fatigue, disease, and may even derange reason. It is this which happened to Victor Hennequin, formerly an editor of La Democratie Pacifique and, after 1848, a member of the National Assembly. He was a young barrister, with a plentiful flow of eloquence, wanting neither education nor talent, but he was infatuated with the reveries of Fourier. Being banished as an after-consequence of December 2nd, he took up table-turning during his enforced inactivity, he fell a victim all too soon to mediomania and believed himself an instrument for the revelations of the soul of the earth. He published a book entitled, Save the Human Race, it was a medley of socialistic and Christian reminiscences, a last gleam of reason flickered therein, but the experiences continued and folly triumphed. In a final work, of which only one volume was issued, Victor Hennequin represents God in the guise of an immense polypus located at the center of the earth, having antennae and horns turned inwards like tendrils all over his brain. As also over that of his wife Octavia. Soon afterwards it was reported that Victor Hennequin had died from the consequences of a maniacal paroxysm in a madhouse. 359 we have also heard of a lady belonging to the aristocracy who gave herself up to communications with pretended spirits in tables and who, scandalized beyond measure at the unsuitable replies of her particular piece of furniture, undertook a journey to Rome to submit the heretical article to the chair of St. Peter. She carried it with her and had an auto de fe in the capital of the Christian world. Better to burn her furniture than to court madness, and to say the truth it was an imminent danger for the lady here in question. Let us not laugh at the episode, for we are children of an age of reason in which men who pass as serious, like the Comte de Mirville, ascribe to the devil unexplained phenomena of nature. In a drama which is well known on the boulevards there is much to be heard of a magician who, requiring a formidable auxiliary, created an automaton, being a monster with the paws of a lion, a bull's horns and the scales of leviathan. To this hybrid sphinx he imparted life, but took flight incontinently, being terrified at the work of his hands. The monster followed in pursuit, appeared between him and his betrothed, set fire to his house, burned his father, carried off his son, and continuing the chase to the sea, followed him on board a ship which he caused to be engulfed. But finally made an end of himself amidst thunder. This awful spectacle, rendered visible by fear, has been realized in the history of humanity, poetry has personified the phantom of evil and has endowed it with all forces of nature. It has sought to enlist the chimera as an aid to morality, and has then gone in fear of the ugliness begotten by its own dreams. 
From this time forward, the monster has pursued us through the ages. It makes grimaces between us and the objects of our love, an impure nightmare, it strangles our children in their sleep, it carries through creation, that father's house of humanity, the inextinguishable torch of hell. It burns and tortures our parents everlastingly, it spreads black wings to hide heaven from our eyes, it shrieks to us, hope no more. It mounts the crupper and gallops behind us like remorse. It plunges into the ocean of despair the last rock of our hopes, it is the old Persian Araman, the Egyptian Typhon, the darksome god confessed by the heretics of Manes, the Comte de Mirville and the black magic of the devil. It is the world's horror and the idol of bad Christians. Men have tried to laugh at it and have been afraid, they have caricatured it and then trembled, for the cartoons have seemed to take life and to mock at those who made them. All this notwithstanding, its reign is over, though it will not perish overwhelmed by a bolt from heaven, science has conquered the lightning and converted it into torches, the monster will dissolve before the brightness of science and truth. The genius of ignorance and darkness can only be blasted by the light. 4. The Fantastic Side of Magical Literature It is now twenty years since Alphonse Esquiros, 361 of the Friends of Our Childhood, issued a work of high fantasy, entitled The Magician. All that the romanticism of that period conceived to be most bizarre was embodied in the story, the author provided his magus with a seraglio of dead ladies, embalmed according to a process which has since been discovered by Ganel. The characters included an automaton of bronze who preached chastity, a hermaphrodite who was in love with the moon and conducted a regular correspondence with that satellite, there were other wonderful things which one has forgotten at this day. Alphonse Esquiros may be said to have founded a school of fantasiasts in magic by the publication of this romance, its most distinguished present representative being the young and interesting Henri Delage, who is a productive writer. An unrecognized thaumaturgist and a gifted charmer. His style is not less astonishing than were the notions of Alphonse Esquiros, his initiator and master. Thus, in his book dealing with those who have risen from the dead, he remarks as follows concerning some objection against Christianity, I take this objection by the throat and, when I loose my grasp, the earth shall resound sullenly under the weight of its strangled corpse. It is true that his reply to the objection comes to very little, but what would you, when an objection has been strangled and when the earth has resounded sullenly under the weight of its body? We have said that Henri Delage is an unrecognized thaumaturgist. As a fact he has informed a person of our acquaintance that during a winter when influenza was prevalent, it was sufficient for him to enter a room and everyone who happened to be therein was cured immediately. Unhappily he became himself a victim of the miracle, for he contracted a slight hoarseness which has never left him. Many of our friends declare that he has the gift of ubiquity. He is left at the office of La Patterie and is found again with his publisher Dantu, one retires in dismay and goes home, there to find, Delage awaiting one's arrival. He is a skillful charmer. A society lady who had been reading one of his books testified that she knew nothing better written or more beautiful, but it is not to his works alone that Delage imparts beauty. We had been reading an article signed Fiorentino which said that the physical attractions of the young magician equaled or even surpassed those of angels. We encountered Delage and questioned him with curiosity on this singular revelation. Delage then put his hand in his waistcoat, turned three parts round and looked smiling to heaven. It happened fortunately that we were carrying the Enchiridion of Leo III, which is known to preserve from enchantments, so that the charmer's angelical beauty was hidden from our eyes. Let us offer on our part a more serious eulogium to Henri Delage than do those who admire his good looks, he is sincere when he says that he is a Catholic and when he proclaims loudly his love and respect for religion. Now religion can make you a saint, and this title is more estimable and glorious than that of a sorcerer. 361. It is owing to his rank as a publicist that we have placed this young man in the first place among the fantasiasts of magic, but in all other respects it belongs to the Comte Dorches. A man of venerable age who has devoted his life and fortune to mesmeric experiments. Ladies in a state of somnambulism, and any furniture at his house, give themselves up to frenzied dances, the furniture becomes worn out and is broken, but it is said that the ladies are all the better for their gyrations. 
For a long time the Kant Dorches has been dominated by a fixed idea, which is the fear of being buried alive, and he has written a number of memorials on the need for verifying decease in a more certain way than obtains usually. He has some justification for such a fear on his own part because his temperament is plethoric, while his extreme nervous susceptibility, continually super-excited by experiments with fair somnambulists, may expose him to attacks of apoplexy. In magnetism he is the pupil of Abbe Faria and in necromancy he belongs to the school of Baron de Goldenstaub. The latter has published a work entitled Practical Experimental Pneumatology, or the reality of spirits and the marvelous phenomenon of their direct writing. He gives an account of his discovery as follows, it was in the course of the year 1850, or about three years prior to the epidemic of table wrapping, that the author sought to introduce into France the circles of American spiritualism. The mysterious Rochester knockings and the purely automatic writing of mediums. Unfortunately he met with many obstacles raised by other mesmerists. Those who were committed to the hypothesis of a magnetic fluid, and even those who styled themselves spiritual mesmerists, but who were really inferior inducers of somnambulism. Treated the mysterious knockings of American spiritualism as visionary follies. It was therefore only after more than six months that the author was able to form his first circle on the American plan, and then thanks to the zealous concurrence of M. Rouston, a former member of the Société de Magnetiseurs Spiritualists, a simple man who was full of enthusiasm for the holy cause of spiritualism. We were joined by a number of other persons, amongst whom was the Abbé Châtel, 362 founder of the Église Française, who, despite his rationalistic tendencies, ended by admitting the reality of objective and supernatural revelation. As an indispensable condition of spiritualism and all practical religions. Setting aside the moral conditions, which are equally requisite, it is known that American circles are based on the distinction of positive and electric or negative magnetic currents. The circles consist of twelve persons, representing in equal proportions the positive and negative or sensitive elements. This distinction does not follow the sex of the members, though generally women are negative and sensitive, while men are positive and magnetic. The mental and physical constitution of each individual must be studied before forming the circles, for some delicate women have masculine qualities, while some strong men are, morally speaking, women. A table is placed in a clear and ventilated spot, the medium is seated at one end and entirely isolated. By his calm and contemplative quietude he serves as a conductor for the electricity, and it may be noted that a good somnambulist is usually an excellent medium. The six electrical or negative dispositions, which are generally recognized by their emotional qualities and their sensibility, are placed at the right of the medium, the most sensitive of all being next him. The same rule is followed with the positive personalities, who are at the left of the medium, with the most positive among them next to him. In order to form a chain, the twelve persons each place their right hand on the table and their left hand on that of their neighbor, thus making a circle round the table. Observe that the medium or mediums, if there be more than one, are entirely isolated from those who form the chain. After a number of seances, certain remarkable phenomena have been obtained, such as simultaneous shocks, felt by all present at the moment of mental evocation on the part of the most intelligent persons. It is the same with mysterious knockings and other strange sounds, many people, including those least sensitive, have had simultaneous visions, though remaining in the ordinary waking state. Sensitive persons have acquired that most wonderful gift of mediumship, namely, automatic writing as the result of an invisible attraction which uses the non-intelligent instrument of a human arm to express its ideas. For the rest, non-sensitive persons experience the mysterious influence of an external wind, but the effect is not strong enough to put their limbs in motion. All these phenomena, obtained according to the mode of American spiritualism, have the defect of being more or less indirect, because it is impossible in these experiences to dispense with the mediation of a human being or medium. It is the same with the table turning which invaded Europe in the middle of the year 1853. The author has had many table experiences with his honorable friend, the Comte d'Orches, one of the most instructed persons in magic and the occult sciences. We attained by degrees the point when tables moved apart from any contact whatever, while the Comte d'Orches has caused them to rise, 
also without contact. The author has made tables rush across a room with great rapidity and not only without contact but without the magnetic aid of a circle of sitters. The vibration of piano chords under similar circumstances took place on January 20, 1856, in the presence of the Comte de Sapri and Comte d'Orches. Now all such phenomena are proof positive of certain occult forces, but they do not demonstrate adequately the real and substantial existence of unseen intelligences, independent of our will and imagination. Though the limits of these have been vastly extended in respect of their possibilities. Hence the reproach made against American spiritualists, because their communications with the world of spirits are so insignificant in character, being confined to mysterious knockings and other sound vibrations. As a fact, there is no direct phenomenon at once intelligent and material, independent of our will and imagination, to compare with the direct writing of spirits, who have neither been invoked nor evoked. And it is this only which offers irrefutable proof as to the reality of the supernatural world. The author, being always in search of such proof, at once intelligent and palpable, concerning the substantial reality of the supernatural world, in order to demonstrate by certain facts the immortality of the soul, has never wearied of addressing fervent prayers to the Eternal, that he might vouchsafe to indicate an infallible means for strengthening that faith in immortality which is the eternal basis of religion. The Eternal, whose mercy is infinite, has abundantly answered this feeble prayer. On August 1, 1856, the idea came to the author of trying whether spirits could write directly, that is, apart from the presence of a medium. Remembering the marvelous direct writing of the Decalogue, communicated to Moses, and that other writing, equally direct and mysterious, at the Feast of Belshazzar, recorded by Daniel. Having further heard about those modern mysteries of Stratford in America, where certain strange and illegible characters were found upon slips of paper, apparently apart from mediumship. The author sought to establish the actuality of such important phenomena, if indeed within the limits of possibility. He therefore placed a sheet of blank letter paper and a sharply pointed pencil in a box, which he then locked and carried the key about him, imparting his design to no one. Twelve days he waited in vain, but what was his astonishment on August 13, 1856, when he found certain mysterious characters traced on the paper. He repeated the experiment ten times on that day, placing a new sheet of paper each time in the box, with the same result invariably. On the following day he made twenty experiments but left the box open, without losing sight of it. He witnessed the formation of characters and words in the Estonian language with no motion of the pencil. The latter being obviously useless he decided to dispense with it and placed blank paper sometimes on a table of his own, sometimes on the pedestals of old statues, on sarcophagi, on urns, and, in the Louvre, at St. Denis, at the Church of Esti. Etienne Dumont, and. Similar experiments were made in different cemeteries of Paris, but the author has no liking for cemeteries, while most spirits prefer the localities where they have lived on earth to those in which their mortal remains are laid to rest. We are far from disputing the singular phenomena observed by Baron de Goldenstaub but would point out to him that the discovery had been made previously by Lavater and that the watercolor portrait 363 painted by the Kabbalist Gabladon is of far greater importance than the few lines of writing obtained on his part. Speaking next in the name of science, we would tell him, not indeed for his benefit, seeing that he will not believe us, but for serious observers of these strange phenomena. That the writings obtained by him do not come from the other world but have been made unconsciously by himself. We would say to him that your experiments, so unduly multiplied, and the excessive tension of your will, have destroyed the equilibrium of your fluidic and astral body. You have compelled it to realize your dreams and it has traced, in characters borrowed from your own remembrance, the reflections of your imagination and of your thoughts. Had you been placed in a perfectly lucid state of magnetic sleep, you would have seen a luminous counterpart of your hand, lengthened out like a shadow in the setting sun. You would have seen it trace on the paper prepared by yourself or your friends those characters which have so much surprised you. That corporeal light which emanates from the earth and from you is contained by a fluidic envelope of extreme elasticity, and that envelope is formed from the quintessence of your vital spirits and your blood. 
this quintessence derives from the light a color determined by your secret will. It is made in the likeness of your dream, and the characters are impressed on the paper as signs on the bodies of unborn children are imprinted by the imagination of their mothers. That which seems to you ink is your blackened and transfigured blood. You are expending yourself in proportion as such writings multiply. If you continue your experiments, your brain will be weakened gradually and your memory will suffer. You will experience unspeakable pains in the joints of the limbs and fingers, and you will finally die, either struck down suddenly or after a prolonged agony, characterized by hallucinations and madness. So much for Baron de Goldenstub. To the Comte d'Orches we would say, you will not be buried alive, but you run the risk of dying by the very precautions which you are taking against such a possibility. The awakening of those who are so buried can only be rapid and brief, but they may live long underground, conserved by the astral light in a complete state of lucid somnambulism. Their souls are then bound to the sleeping body by an invisible chain, and if those souls are greedy and criminal, they can draw on the quintessence of the blood in persons who are naturally asleep. They can transmit this sap to their interred bodies for their longer preservation, in the vague hope that they may be restored ultimately to life. It is this frightful phenomenon which is called vampirism, and its reality has been established by many cases as well attested as the most serious things in history. If you question the possibility of this magnetic life of the human body under earth, read the following account of an English officer, named Osborne, the good faith of which was attested to Baron du Potet by General Ventura. On June 6, 1838, says Mr. Osborne, the monotony of our camp life was happily interrupted by the arrival of an individual who was famous throughout the Punjab. He was the subject of great veneration among the Sikhs because of his power to remain buried underground for so long a time as he pleased. Such extraordinary stories are told of this man, and their authenticity has been guaranteed by so many reputable persons, that we were most anxious to see him. He told us on his own part that he had followed this business of interment for a number of years in various parts of India. Among serious and creditable people who have borne witness in his favor I may mention Captain Wade, the political agent at Ladron. This officer has told me most seriously that he himself assisted at the resurrection of the said fakir after a burial which took place several months previously, in the presence of General Ventura, the Maharaja and the principal Sikh chiefs. The details concerning the interment as given to Captain Wade, and those which he added on his own authority respecting the exhumation are as follows. After certain precautions which lasted for several days and the details of which are distasteful, the fakir announced that he was ready to undergo the trial. The Maharaja, Sikh chiefs and General Ventura assembled round a grave of stonework constructed for the express purpose. In their presence the fakir sealed up with wax every opening of his body by which air could enter, with the exception of the mouth. He then cast off his garments, was enveloped in a linen bag and, by his own wish, his tongue was turned back so that it obstructed the gullet. He fell after this into a kind of lethargy. The bag which contained him was closed up, and a seal was placed therein by the Maharaja. It was then put into a sealed and padlocked chest, which was lowered into the grave. A large quantity of earth was thrown on it. It was trodden down and barley was sown therein. Finally, sentinels were stationed round the spot, with orders to watch day and night. These precautions notwithstanding, the Maharaja still had doubts. Thrice during the period of ten months, during which the fakir was to remain interred, he visited the grave and had it opened in his presence, but the body was in the sack, just as it had been placed therein, cold and inanimate to all appearance. When the ten months had expired, the fakir was exhumed finally. General Ventura and Captain Wade undid the padlocks, broke the seals and raised the chest from the grave. The fakir was taken out, but there was no indication of life either at heart or pulse. As a first means to reanimate him, one of the spectators inserted his finger very gently in the mouth and restored the tongue to its natural position. The top of the head was the sole seat of any sensible heat. By pouring warm water slowly over the body, some signs of life were obtained by degrees. After two hours of attention, the fakir rose up and began to move about smiling. 
The extraordinary being declared that he had delicious dreams during his entombment, but that the time of awaking was always exceedingly painful and that he was in a state of vertigo before his return to consciousness. His age is about thirty years, his countenance is ill-favored and his expression somewhat crafty. We had long conversations with him, and he offered to be buried in our presence. We took him at his word and appointed a meeting at Lahore, where we promised that he would remain underground throughout our stay in that city. Such was the story of Osborne. The question was whether the fakir would really allow himself to be interred once more. The new experiment might well be decisive. But that which happened was as follows. Fifteen days after the fakir's visit to their camp, the English officers arrived at Lahore. They chose a spot which seemed favorable for the coming operation, had a mural tomb constructed, as well as a very solid chest, and then awaited the fakir. He came on the day following, expressing an ardent desire to prove that he was no impostor. He stated further that he had made the necessary preparations for an experiment, but his demeanor evidenced a certain disquiet and despondency. He began to stipulate concerning his compensation, which was fixed at fifteen hundred rupees down and two thousand rupees annually, which the officers undertook to obtain from the king. Satisfied on this point, he wished to be informed as to the precautions that they were proposing to take. The officers shewed him the chest, the keys belonging thereto, and warned him that sentinels chosen among the English soldiers would watch round the place for a week. The fakir cried out and gave vent to much abuse of the firing geese and skeptics, who sought to rob him of his reputation. He expressed also a fear that some attempt would be made on his life and, refusing to trust himself entirely to the surveillance of Europeans, he demanded that duplicate keys should be committed to one of his co-religionists. Further insisting, and this indeed above all, that the sentries should not be enemies of his faith. The officers declined to entertain these conditions, several interviews followed, leading to no result. And finally the fakir intimated, through one of the Sikh chiefs, that the Maharaja having menaced him with his anger if he did not fulfill his engagement with the English, it was his wish to undertake the trial. Though he rested assured that the sole object of the officers was to deprive him of life, and that he would never come forth from his tomb. The officers admitted that, as to the last point, they all shared his conviction, adding that as they did not wish to have his death as a reproach against them, they relieved him of his promise. Are such hesitations and fears proof positive against the fakir? Does it follow that all who have testified previously how they had beheld with their own eyes the occurrences to which he owes his celebrity have been guilty of deception themselves or were the victims of skillful trickery? We confess that, having regard to the extent and quality of the evidence, we cannot doubt that the fakir was frequently and literally interred. And even admitting that after his burial he has on each occasion continued to communicate with the world above ground. It would still be inexplicable how he could be deprived of respiration during the time which intervened between his burial and that moment when his accomplices came to his aid. Mr. Osborne adds in a note a quotation from the Medical Topography of Lodiana, by Diar. MacGregor, an English physician, who assisted at one of the exhumations, was a witness of the fakir's lethargy, of his gradual return to life, and who tries seriously to explain it. Mr. Boylo, another English officer, in a work published some years ago, recounts how he witnessed another experience which reproduced all the facts in precisely the same manner. Those who are anxious to satisfy their curiosity more fully, those who discern in the narrative an indication of a curious physiological fact, may refer with confidence to the sources which are here indicated. A number of official records of the exhumation of vampires are still extant. In each case the flesh was in a remarkable state of preservation, but blood oozed from the body, the hair had grown in an abnormal manner and protruded in tufts through the chinks of the coffin. There was no sign of life in the respiratory apparatus, save in the heart only, and this seemed to have become a vegetable rather than an animal organ. To kill the vampire, a stake had to be driven through the breast and then a frightful cry shewed that the somnambulist of the grave had awakened with a start into a veritable death. To render such death definitive, swords were driven point upward into the vampire's grave, for the phantoms of astral light are disintegrated by the action of metallic points. 
which attract that light towards the common reservoir and dissipate its coagulated clusters. To reassure nervous people, it may be added that cases of vampirism are fortunately exceedingly rare and that no one who is healthy in mind and body can be personally victimized, unless he or she has been abandoned, body and soul, to the creature in its lifetime by some criminal complicity or irregular passion. The following history of a vampire is related by Tournefort in his voyage to the Levant.364. In the island of Mykona we witnessed a very singular scene, being the alleged return of a deceased person after interment. In northern Europe those who come back in this manner are called vampires, while the Greeks designated them under the name of Brukalox. The case in question was that of a peasant of Mykona who was naturally gloomy and quarrelsome. It is a circumstance worthy of note, on account of parallel instances. He was killed in the countryside, no one knew why or by whom. Two days after his burial in a church of the city, a report went abroad that he was seen nightly wandering about at a great pace. He also visited houses, turned over the furniture, put out the lights, embraced people from behind and performed innumerable other tricks. At first it was a laughing matter, but it took a serious turn when reliable people began to complain. The priests themselves certified to the fact, and no doubt they had their reasons. Recourse was had to masses, said for the purpose, but the peasant continued the same course with no sign of amendment. After several meetings of the chief persons, priests and monks of the town, it was concluded to wait for the expiration of nine days after the interment, following I know not what ancient procedure. On the tenth day a mass was said in the church wherein the body had been buried, for the purpose of expelling the demon who was thought to have entered into it. The mass over, the corpse was disinterred and the heart removed. It was necessary to burn incense owing to the evil smell, but the combination made bad worse and almost stifled those present. It was testified that a thick smoke exhaled from the corpse, and we who were present at the operations did not venture to suggest that it was really the smoke of the incense. There were also those who affirmed that the blood of the unfortunate person was abnormally scarlet, while yet others declared that the flesh was still warm. Whence it was concluded that the deceased person was seriously wrong in not being properly dead, or rather in allowing himself to be brought to life by the devil. This is precisely the idea which obtains concerning the vampire, and that word began to be repeated persistently. A crowd assembled, loudly protesting that the body was obviously not rigid when it was carried to the church for burial and that it was therefore a veritable vampire. Appeal being made to us, we expressed the opinion that the person was undoubtedly dead, and as for the supposed scarlet blood, it was easy to see that it was only bad-smelling slime. For the rest, we attempted to cure or at least not provoke further their excited imaginations by explaining the fumes and warmth attributed to the corpse. Such arguments notwithstanding, it was determined to burn the heart of the deceased person, but after this had been done he was not more amenable than formerly and indeed created greater stir. He was accused of beating people at night, of breaking down doors and windows, tearing garments and emptying pitchers and bottles. Altogether, the deceased made himself highly objectionable. There is reason to believe that he spared no house save that of the consul, in which we happened to be lodging. Every imagination was overwrought, people of good sense being affected as much as others. A disease of the brain seemed abroad, as dangerous as that of madness, entire families abandoned their houses and carried their pallets to the outskirts, there to pass the night. Even then they complained of fresh insults, and the most sober retired into the country. Citizens who were imbued with a sense of public zeal decided that one essential detail had been missed, so far, in the observance. From their point of view, the Mass should have been celebrated after and not before removing the heart from the body. With this precaution it was pretended that the devil would have been taken by surprise and would not have attempted to return. But unfortunately they began with the Mass, which gave him time to depart and he was able to come back at his ease. These considerations left matters in their original state of difficulty. There were meetings and still meetings, both evening and morning, there were processions for three days and three nights, fasts were imposed on the priests, houses were visited by them, aspergillus in hand. There was sprinkling with holy water and doors were purified. 
Even the mouth of the miserable vampire was filled with holy water. In the midst of such prepossessions, our course was to say nothing. We should have been regarded as jesters and infidels. What however was to be done to help the inhabitants? Every morning brought a fresh scene in the comedy by the recital of new pranks of this nightbird, who was even accused of committing the most abominable crimes. We did, however, represent more than once to the governor of the town that in our own country, under such circumstances, a watch would not fail to be set, to take note of what passed. The precaution was ultimately taken and led to the arrest of some vagabonds who were undoubtedly at the bottom of the disorder. It was, of course, relaxed too soon, and two days subsequently, to atone for the fast which the said wastrels had undergone in prison, they betook themselves to emptying the wine jars in some of the abandoned houses. After driving in numberless drawn swords over the grave of the body, people now returned to their prayers, combined with disinterring the corpse as Caprice led them, when an Albanian, who happened to be there, pointed out in an authoritative tone that it was highly ridiculous, in a case of the kind, to make use of the swords of Christians. These being cross-handled effectually prevented the devil from leaving the body and his recommendation was therefore to substitute Turkish sabers. The advice of this expert came to nothing. The vampire was not more tractable, and they knew not what saint to invoke, when all with one voice, as if a word of command had been given, cried out through the whole town that the vampire must be burned completely. After which they might defy the devil, and that certainly it was better to have recourse to this extremity rather than that the island should be deserted. As a fact, certain families were preparing already for their departure. The vampire was therefore carried, by order of the governors, to the extremity of the Isle of Asti. George, where a great pyre had been prepared with tar, lest even dry wood should not kindle quickly enough. What remained of the miserable body was cast therein and speedily consumed. This was on the first day of January, 1701. Henceforth there were no complaints against the vampire, it was agreed that the devil had that time been overreached and songs were made to deride him. It is to be observed in this account of Tournefort that he admits the reality of the visions which paralyzed the whole people. He does not deny the flexibility or warmth of the corpse but seeks to explain these with the praiseworthy object of reassuring those who were concerned. He does not mention the decomposition of the body but only its evil smell, which is not less characteristic of vampire corpses than of venomous toadstools. Finally he allows that once the body was burned, the wonders and visions ceased. But we have wandered far from the subject of phantasiasts in magic, let us return to them and, forgetting the problem of vampires, a word shall be said on the cartomancist, Edmund. He is the pet sorcerer of ladies in the Cartier de Notre Dame de Lorette and he occupies, in the Rue Fontaine St. George's, number 30, a dainty little room, where the vestibule is always full of clients, including those occasionally of the male sex. Edmund is a man of tall stature, somewhat stout, of pale complexion, open countenance and sympathetic voice. He appears to believe in his own art and carries unconscientiously the methods of people like Attila and Lee. Lenormand. We have questioned him as to his processes, and he has answered frankly and civilly that he has been passionately devoted to the occult sciences from childhood, that he began divination early. That he is unacquainted with the philosophical secrets of transcendental knowledge, and that the keys of the Kabbalah of Solomon are not in his possession. He states, however, that he is highly sensitive and that the mere proximity of his clients impresses him so keenly that in a way he feels their destiny. I seem to hear singular noises and clankings of chains about those who are doomed to the scaffold, cries and moans round those who will die violently. Supernatural odors assail and almost stifle me. One day, in the presence of a veiled lady, clothed in black, I began to tremble at an odor of straw and blood. Madam, I cried, pray leave here, for you are surrounded by an atmosphere of murder and prison. You say truly, she answered, unveiling her pale face, I have been accused of infanticide and have just come out of prison. Since you have seen the past, tell me also the future. One of our friends and disciples in Kabbalism, utterly unknown to Edmund, went on a day to consult him and having paid in advance he awaited the oracles, when Edmund, rising respectfully, begged him to take back his money. 
I have nothing to tell you, he explained, your destiny is closed against me by the key of occultism, whatsoever I might say you would know already as well as myself. He shooed him out with many bows. Edmund is also occupied with judicial astrology, he erects horoscopes and judges nativities at very moderate prices. In a word he deals with everything belonging to his business, which is otherwise a wearisome and disenchanting thing. With how many disordered brains and diseased hearts must he be continually in relation, and the imbecile requirements of some, the unjust reproaches of others, the tiring confidences, the demands for filters and spells, the obsessions of fools. All combine in making him gain his income hardly. To sum up, Edmund is a somnambulist like Alexis, he is self magnetized by his cards and by the diabolical figures which adorn them, he wears black and gives his consultations in a black cabinet, in a word, he is the prophet of mystery. V. Some private recollections of the writer. On a certain morning in 1839 the author of this book had a visit from Alphonse Esquiros, who said, let us pay our respects to the Mapa. 365 The natural question arose, but in any case, who or what is the Mapa? He is a god, was the answer. Many thanks, said the author, but I pay my devotions only to gods unseen. Come notwithstanding, he is the most eloquent, most radiant and magnificent fool in the visible order of things. My friend, I am in terror of fools, their complaint is contagious. Granted, delectisime. And yet I am calling on you. Admitted, and things being so, we will pay our respects to the Mapa. In an appalling garret there was a bearded man of majestic demeanor who invariably wore over his clothes the tattered cloak of a woman, and had in consequence rather the air of a destitute dervish. He was surrounded by several men, bearded and ecstatic like himself, and in addition to these there was a woman with motionless features, who seemed like an entranced somnambulist. The prophet's manner was abrupt and yet sympathetic. He had hallucinated eyes and an infectious quality of eloquence. He spoke with emphasis, warmed to his subject quickly, chafed and fumed till a white froth gathered on his lips. Abbe Lamine was once termed Old 93 fulfilling its Easter duties. The catchphrase is more suited to the Mapa and his mysticism, as will be shown by a fragment from one of his lyrical enthusiasms. Transgression was inevitable for man, it was decreed by his destiny, that he might be the instrument of his own reconstruction, that the greatness and majesty of God might be manifested in the majesty and greatness of human toil. Passing through its successive phases of light and darkness. But primitive unity was destroyed by the fall, suffering entered the world in the guise of the serpent, and the tree of life became the tree of death. Things being at this pass, God said to the woman, in sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, yet added afterwards, thou shalt crush the serpent's head. And the first slave was a woman. She accepted her divine mission, and the pains of travail began. From the first hour of the fall, the task of humanity has been, for this reason, a great and terrible task of initiation. For this also the terms of that initiation are all equally sacred in the eyes of God. Their Alpha is our common mother Eve, while the Omega is Liberty, who is our common mother also. I beheld a vast ship, having a gigantic mast with its crow's nest at the top, one of the ship's extremities looked to the west, the other to the east. On the western side it was poised upon the cloudy summits of three mountains, their bases lost in a raging sea. On the flank of each mountain was inscribed its ominous name. The first was Golgotha, the second Mont Saint Jean, but the third was Asti. Helena. In the middle way of the mast, on the western side, there was erected a five-armed cross, 366 on which a woman was expiring. The inscription above her head was, France, June 18, 1815, Good Friday. The five arms of the cross represented the five divisions of the globe, the woman's head rested on Europe and was encircled by a cloud. But at the end of the ship to the east there was no darkness. And the keel paused at the threshold of the city of God, by the summit of a triumphal arch in the full rays of the sun. Here the woman reappeared, but this time transfigured and glorious. She rolled away the stone from the sepulchre, and on that stone was written, Restoration, Days of the Tomb, July 29, 
1830, Easter. It will be seen that the Mapa was a successor of Catherine Theot and Dom Girl. And yet, such is the strange sympathy between follies, he told us one day confidentially that he was Louis XVII returned to earth for a work of regeneration, while the woman who shared his life was Marie Antoinette of France. He explained further that his revolutionary theories were the last word of the violent pretensions of Cain, destined as such to ensure, by a fatal reaction, the victory of the just able. Now Esquiros and I visited the Mapa to enjoy his extravagances, but our imaginations were overcome by his eloquence. We were two college friends, like Louis Lambert and Balzac, and we had nourished dreams in common concerning impossible renunciations and unheard of heroisms. After visiting Gano, for this was the name of the Mapa, we took it into our heads that it would be a great thing to communicate the last word of revolution to the world and to seal the abyss of anarchy, like Curtius. By casting ourselves therein. Our students' extravagance gave birth to the Gospel of the People and the Bible of Liberty, follies for which Esquiros and his ill-starred friend paid but too dearly. Hereof is the danger of enthusiastic manias, they are catching. One does not approach with impunity the edge of the precipice of madness. The incident which now follows is a different and more terrible fatality. A nervous and delicate young man named Sobrier was numbered among the Mapa's disciples. He lost his head completely and believed himself predestined to save the world by provoking the supreme crisis of an universal revolution. The days of 1848 drew towards the threshold. A commotion had led to some change in the ministry, but the episode seemed closed. Paris had an air of contentment and the boulevards were illuminated. Suddenly a young man appeared in the populous streets of the Cartier Saint Martin. He was preceded by two street Arabs, one bearing a torch and the other beating to arms. A large crowd gathered, the young man got upon a post and harangued the people. His words were incoherent and incendiary, but the gist was to proceed to the Boulevard de Capucines and acquaint the ministry with the will of the people. The demoniac repeated the same harangue at every corner of the streets and presently he was marching at the head of a great concourse, a pistol in each hand, still heralded by torch and tambour. The frequenters of the boulevards joyed out of mere curiosity, and subsequently it was a crowd no longer but the massed populace surging through the boulevard de Italians. In the midst of this the young man and his street Arabs disappeared, but before the Hotel de Capucines a pistol shot was fired upon the people. This shot was the revolution, and it was fired by a fool. Throughout that night two carts loaded with corpses perambulated the streets by torchlight, on the morrow all Paris was barricaded, and Sobrier was reported at home in a state of unconsciousness. It was he who, without knowing what he did, had for a moment shaken the world. Gano and Sobrier are dead and no harm is done them by reciting this terrible instance of the magnetism of enthusiasts and the fatalities which may be entailed by the nervous diseases of certain persons. The story is drawn from a reliable source and its revelations may suit the conscience of that Belisarius of poetry who is the author of the history of the Girondins. The magnetic phenomena produced by Gano continued even after his death. His widow, a woman of no education and little intelligence, the daughter of an honest peasant of Auvergne, remained in the static somnambulism in which she had been placed by her husband. 367 Like the child which assumes the form of its mother's imagination, she has become a living image of Marie Antoinette, when a prisoner at the conciergerie. Her manners are those of a queen who is widowed and desolate forever. A complaint sometimes escapes her, as though she were weary of her dream, but she is sovereignly indignant with any who seek to awake her. For the rest, she has no symptom of mental alienation. Her outward conduct is reasonable, her life perfectly honorable and regular. Nothing is more pathetic, to our thinking, than this persistent obsession of a being fondly loved who lives again in a conjugal hallucination. Had Artemis existed literally it would be permissible to believe that Mao Sol was also a powerful mesmerist, and that he had gained and fixed forever the affections of an extremely sensitive woman, outside all limits of free will and reason. 6. The Occult Sciences The secret of the occult sciences is that of nature herself, it is the secret of the generation of angels and worlds, it is that of God's own omnipotence. Ye shall be as the Elohim, 
knowing good and evil. So testified the serpent of Genesis, and so did the tree of knowledge become the tree of death. For six thousand years the martyrs of science have toiled and perished at the foot of this tree, so that it may become once more the tree of life. That absolute which is sought by the foolish and found only by the wise is the truth, the reality, and the reason of universal equilibrium. Such equilibrium is the harmony which proceeds from the analogy of opposites. Humanity has sought so far to balance itself as if on one leg, now on one and now again on the other. Civilizations have sprung up and have fallen, through the anarchic alienation of despotism, or alternatively through the despotic anarchy of revolt. Here superstitious enthusiasms and there the pitiful schemes of materialistic instinct have misguided the nations, but at last it is God himself who impels the world towards believing reason and reasonable beliefs. We have had enough and to spare of the prophets apart from philosophy and the philosophers destitute of religion. Blind believers and skeptics are on a par with one another, and both are equally remote from eternal salvation. In the chaos of universal doubt, and amidst the conflict of science and faith, the great men and the seers figure as sickly artists, seeking the ideal beauty at the risk of their reason and their life. Look at them now even, these sublime children. They are whimsical and nervous, like women, a shadow maims them, reason injures, they are unjust even to each other. And though assuredly on the quest of crowns, in their fantastic excesses they are the first to be guilty of that which Pythagoras forbids in one of his admirable symbols, they are the first to revile crowns and to trample them under their feet. They are fanatics of glory, but the good God has bound them by the chains of opinion, so that they may not be openly dangerous. Genius is judged by the tribunal of mediocrity, and this judgment is without appeal, because, being the light of the world, genius is accounted as a thing that is null and dead whenever it ceases to enlighten. The ecstasy of the poet is controlled by the indifference of the prosaic multitude, and every enthusiast who is rejected by general good sense is a fool and not a genius. Do not count the great artists as bondsmen of the ignorant crowd, for it is the crowd which imparts to their talent the balance of reason. Light is the equilibrium between shadow and brightness. Motion is the equilibrium between inertia and activity. Authority is the equilibrium between liberty and power. Wisdom is equilibrium in thought, virtue is equilibrium in the affections, beauty is equilibrium in form. Outlines that are lovely are true outlines, and the magnificence of nature is an algebra of graces and splendors. Whatsoever is true is beautiful, all that is beautiful should be true. Heaven and hell are the equilibrium of moral life. Good and evil are the equilibrium of liberty. The great work is the attainment of that middle point in which equilibrating force abides. Furthermore, the reactions of equilibrated force do everywhere conserve universal life by the perpetual motion of birth and death. It is for this reason that the philosophers have compared their gold to the sun. For the same reason that same gold cures all diseases of the soul and communicates immortality. Those who have found this middle point are true and wonder-working adepts of science and reason. They are masters of the wealth of worlds, confidants and friends of the princes of heaven itself, and nature obeys them because they will what is willed by the law which is the motive power of nature. It is this which the Saviour of the world spoke of as the kingdom of heaven, this also is the sanctum regnum of the holy Kabbalah. It is the crown and ring of Solomon. It is the scepter of Joseph which the stars obeyed in heaven and the harvests on earth. We have discovered this secret of omnipotence, it is not for sale in the market. But if God had commanded us to set a price thereon, we question whether the whole fortune of the buyers would seem its equivalent. Not for ourselves but for them, we should demand in addition their undivided soul and their entire life. 7. Summary and Conclusion It remains for us to summarize and conclude. To summarize the history of a science is to summarize the science itself, and we are therefore to recapitulate the great principles of initiation, as preserved and transmitted through all the ages. Magical science is the absolute science of equilibrium. It is essentially religious, it presided at the formation of dogmas in the antique world and has been thus the nursing mother of all civilizations. 
O chaste and mysterious mother who, in giving milk of poetry and inspiration to the dawning generations, didst cover thy face and breast. Before all things she directs us to believe in God and to adore without seeking to define Him, since a God in definition is to some extent a finite God. And after Deity she points to eternal mathematics and equilibrated forces as to the sovereign principles of things. It is said in the Bible that God has ordered all things according to weight, number and measure. Omnia in pondera et numero et mensura dispasut deus. Weight is equilibrium, number is quantity, measure is proportion, these three, and these are the eternal or divine basis of the science of nature. Here now is the formula of equilibrium, harmony results from the analogy of contraries. Number is the scale of analogies, the proportion of which is measure. The entire occult philosophy of the Zohar might be termed the science of equilibrium. 368 The key of numbers is found in the Sepra Yetzirah, their generation is analogous to the affiliation of ideas and the production of forms. On this account the illuminated hierophants of the Kabbalah combine the hieroglyphic signs of numbers, ideas and forms in their sacred alphabet. The combinations of this alphabet give equations of ideas, and comprise by way of indication all possible combinations in natural forms. According to Genesis, God made man in his image, but as man is the living synthesis of creation, it follows that creation itself is made in the likeness of God. There are three things in the universe, the spirit, the plastic mediator and matter. The ancients assigned to spirit, as its immediate instrument, that igneous fluid to which they gave the generic name of sulfur, to the plastic mediator, they assigned the name of mercury, because of the symbolism represented by the caduceus. To matter, they gave the name of salt, because of the fixed salt which remains after combustion, resisting the further action of fire. Sulfur was compared with the father on account of the generative action of fire. Mercury with the mother, because of its power of attraction and reproduction, and salt, in fine, was the child, or that substance which is subjected to education by nature. For them also the creative substance was one, and the name which they gave it was light. Positive or igneous light was volatile sulfur, light in the negative state, or made visible by the vibrations of fire, was the fluidic or ethereal mercury. And light neutralized, or shadow, the coagulated or fixed composite under the form of earth, was termed salt. After such manner did Hermes Trismegistus formulate his symbol, which is called the Emerald Tablet, that which is above is like that which is below, and that which is below is like that which is above. For the operations of the wonders of the one thing. 369 This means that the universal movement is produced by the analogies of fixed and volatile, the volatile tending to be fixed and the fixed to become volatile, thus producing a continual exchange between the modes of the one substance and from the fact of the exchange, the combinations of universal form in everlasting renewal. The fire is Osiris, or the sun, the light is Isis, or the moon. They are the father and mother of that grand telesma which is the universal substance, not that they are its creators but rather its generating powers, the combined effort of which produces the fixed or earth. Whence Hermes says that this force has reached its plenary manifestation when earth has been formed therefrom. Osiris is not therefore God, even for the great hierophants of the Egyptian sanctuary. He is the igneous or luminous shadow of the intellectual principle of life, and hence in the supreme moment of initiation a flying voice whispered in the ear of the adept that dubious revelation, Osiris is a black god. Woe to the recipient whose understanding had not been raised by faith above the purely physical symbols of Egyptian revelation. Such words would become for him a formula of atheism, and his mind would be struck with blindness. But for the believer, more exalted in intelligence, those same words sounded like an earnest of the most sublime hopes. It was as if the initiator said to him, My child, you mistake a lamp for the sun, but that lamp is only a star of night. Still, the true sun exists, leave therefore the night and seek the day. That which the ancients understood by the four elements in no wise signified simple bodies, but rather the four elementary manifestations of the one substance. These modes were represented by the sphinx, its wings corresponding to air, the woman's breasts to water, the body of the bull to earth, and the lion's claws to fire. 
The one substance, thrice threefold in essential mode and tetradic in the form of manifestation, such as the secret of the three pyramids, triangular in respect of their elevation, square at the base and guarded by the Sphinx. In raising these monuments Egypt attempted to erect the Herculean pillars of universal science. Sands have accumulated, centuries have passed, but the pyramids in their eternal greatness still propound to the nations that enigma of which the solution is lost. As to the Sphinx, it seems to have sunk in the dust of ages. The great empires of Daniel have reigned by turn upon the earth and have gone down into the tomb, overwhelmed by their own weight. Conquests on the field of battle, monuments of labor, results of human passions, all are engulfed with the symbolic body of the Sphinx, now only the human head rises over the desert sands as if looking for the universal empire of thought. Divine or die, such was the terrible dilemma proposed by the Sphinx to the candidates for Theban royalty. The reason is that the secrets of science are actually those of life, the alternatives are to reign or to serve, to be or not to be. The natural forces will break us if we do not put them to use for the conquest of the world. There is no mean between the height of kinghood and the abyss of the victim state, unless we are content to be counted among those who are nothing because they ask not why or what they are. The composite form of the Sphinx also represents by hieroglyphical analogy the four properties of the universal agent, that is to say, the astral light, dissolving, coagulating, heating and cooling. These four properties, directed by the will of man, can modify all phases of nature, producing life or death, health or disease, love or hatred, wealth even or poverty, in accordance with the given impulsion. They can place all the reflections of the light at the service of imagination, they are the paradoxical solution of the wildest questions which can be set for transcendental magic. Specimens of these paradoxical questions shall here follow, together with the answers thereto, 1. Is it possible to escape death? 2. Is there such a thing as the philosophical stone, and what must be done to find it? 3. Is it possible to be served by spirits? 4. What is meant by the key, ring and seal of Solomon? 5. Is it possible to predict the future by reliable calculations? 6. Can good or evil be worked at will by means of magical power? 7. What must be done to become a true magician? 8. What are the precise forces put in operation by black magic? We term these questions paradoxical because they are outside all that is understood as science, while at the same time they seem negative by faith. If propounded by an uninitiated person, they are merely foolhardy, while their complete solution, if given by an adept, would seem like a sacrilege. God and nature alike have closed the sanctuary of transcendent science and this in such a manner that, beyond a certain limit, he who knows would speak to no purpose, because he would not be understood. The revelation of the great magical secret is therefore happily impossible. The replies which we are about to give will be the last possible expression of the word in magic, and they will be put in all clearness, but we do not guarantee to make them comprehensible to our readers. In respect of the first and second, it is possible to escape death after two manners, in time and in eternity. We escape it in time by the cure of diseases and by avoiding the infirmities of old age. We escape it in respect of eternity by perpetuating in memory personal identity amidst the transformations of existence. Let it be certified, 1, that the life resulting from motion can only be maintained by the succession and the perfecting of forms, 2, that the science of perpetual motion is the science of life. 3, that the purpose of this science is the correct apprehension of equilibrated influences, 4, that all renewal operates by destruction, each generation therefore involving a death and each death a generation. Let us now further certify, with the ancient sages, that the universal principle of life is a substantial movement or a substance which is eternally and essentially moved and mover, invisible and impalpable. In a volatile state and manifesting materially when it becomes fixed by the phenomena of polarization. This substance is indefectible, incorruptible and consequently immortal, but its manifestations in the world of form are subject to eternal mutation by the perpetuity of movement. Thus all dies because all lives, and if it were possible to make any form eternal, then motion would be arrested and the only real death would be thus created. 
To imprison a soul forever in a mummified human body, such would be the terrible solution of that magical paradox concerning pretended immortality in the same body and on the same earth. All is regenerated by the universal dissolvent of the first substance. The force of this dissolvent is concentrated in the quintessence, that is to say, at the equilibrating center of a dual polarity. The four elements of the ancients are the four forces of the universal magnet, represented by the figure of a cross, which cross revolves indefinitely about its own center and so propounds the enigma respecting the quadrature of the circle. The creative word speaks from the middle of the cross and cries, it is finished. It is in the exact proportion of the four elementary forms that we must seek the universal medicine of bodies, even as the medicine of the soul is offered by religion in him who gives himself eternally on the cross for the salvation of the world. The magnetic state and polarization of the heavenly bodies results from their equilibrated gravitation about suns, which are the common reservoirs of their electromagnetism. The vibration of the quintessence about common reservoirs manifests by light, and the polarization of light is revealed by colors. White is the color of the quintessence. This color condenses towards its negative pole as blue and becomes fixed as black, while it condenses towards its positive pole as yellow and becomes fixed as red. Thus centrifugal life proceeds always from black to red, passing by white, and centripetal life returns from red to black, following the same path. The four intermediates or mixed hues produce with the three primary colors what are called the seven colors of the prism and the solar spectrum. These seven colors form seven atmospheres or seven luminous zones round each sun, and the planet which is dominant in each zone is magnetized in a manner analogous to the color of its atmosphere. In the depths of the earth, metals are formed like planets in the sky, by the particular influences of a latent light which decomposes when traversing certain regions. To take possession of a subject in which the metallic light is latent, before it becomes specialized, and drive it to the extreme positive pole, that is to say, to the live red. By the help of a fire derived from the light itself, such is the secret in full of the great work. It will be understood that this positive light at its extreme degree of condensation is life itself in a fixed state, serving as a universal dissolvent and as a medicine for all kingdoms of nature. But to extract from marcasite, stibium and philosophical arsenic the living and bisexual metallic sperm, we must have a prime dissolvent which is a mineral saline menstruum, and there must be, moreover, the concurrence of magnetism and electricity. The rest proceeds of itself in a single vessel, being the athenor, and by the graduated fire of one lamp. The adepts say that it is a work of women and children. The heat, light, electricity and magnetism of modern chemists and physicists were for the ancients elementary phenomenal manifestations of one substance, called our, O.D. and Ab, that is to say, O.D. is the active, Ab the passive. An hour is the name of the bisexual and equilibrated composite which is signified when the hermetic philosophers speak of gold. Vulgar gold is metallized hour and philosophical gold is the same hour in the state of a soluble gem. Theoretically, according to the transcendental science of antiquity, the philosophical stone which heals all diseases and accomplishes the transmutation of metals exists therefore incontestably. Does it, however, or can it, exist in fact? If we answer this in the affirmative, no one will believe, and the simple statement shall stand as a paradoxical solution of the paradoxes expressed by the two first questions. Without dealing with the problem as to what must be done in order to find the philosophical stone. M. de la police would reply in our place that in order to find one must of necessity seek, unless indeed discovery is a matter of chance. Enough has been said to direct and facilitate research. The third and fourth questions concern the ministry of spirits and the key, seal and ring of Solomon. When the Savior of the world, at his temptation in the desert, overcame the three lusts which keep the soul in bondage, that is to say, the lust of the appetites. Lust of ambition and lust of greed, it is written that the angels came down to serve him. The explanation is that spirits are subject to the sovereign spirit, and he is the sovereign spirit who binds the rebellious turbulence and unlawful propensities of the flesh. It should be noted at the same time that to reverse the natural order of communication subsisting between things which are, is opposed to the law of providence. 
we do not find that the Saviour of the world and His Apostles evoked the souls of the dead. The immortality of the soul, being one of the most consoling dogmas of religion, is reserved for the aspirations of faith and will never be proved by facts accessible to the criticism of science. Loss of reason, or its distraction at the very least, is hence and will be always the penalty of those who dare to pry into the other life with the eyes of this world only. Hence also magical traditions always represent the spirits of the dead as responding to evocations with sad and angry countenances. They complain of being troubled in their repose and they proffer only reproaches and menaces. The keys of Solomon are religious and rational forces expressed by signs, and their use is not so much in the evocation of spirits as to shield us from aberration in experiences relative to the occult sciences. The seal is the synthesis of the keys and the ring indicates its use. The ring of Solomon is at once round and square, and it represents the mystery of the quadrature of the circle. It is composed of seven squares so arranged that they form a circle. Their bezels are round and square, one being of gold and the other of silver. The ring should be a filigree of the seven metals. In the silver setting a white stone is placed and in the gold one there is a red stone. The white stone bears the sign of the macrocosm, while the microcosm is on the red stone. When the ring is worn upon the finger, one of the stones should be turned inward and the other outward, accordingly as it is desired to command spirits of light or darkness. The plenary powers of this ring can be accounted for in a few words. The will is omnipotent when armed with the living forces of nature. Thought is idle and dead until it manifests by word or sign, it can therefore neither spur nor direct will. The sign, being the indispensable form of thought, is the necessary instrument of will. The more perfect the sign the more powerfully is the thought formulated, and the will is consequently directed with more force. Blind faith moves mountains, and what therefore would be possible to faith if enlightened by complete and indubitable science? If the soul could concentrate its plenary understanding and energy in the utterance of a single word, would not that word be all-powerful? The Ring of Solomon, with its double seal, typifies all science and faith of the Magi expressed by one sign. It symbolizes the powers of heaven and earth and the sacred laws which rule them, whether in the celestial macrocosm or in the microcosm of man. It is the talisman of talismans and the pantacle which is above pantacles. As a sign of life it is omnipotent, but it is without efficacy as a dead sign, intelligence and faith, the intelligence of nature and faith in its eternally active cause, of such is the life of signs. The profound study of natural mysteries may alienate the casual observer from God because mental fatigue paralyses the aspirations of the heart. It is in this sense that the occult sciences may be dangerous and even fatal for certain personalities. Mathematical exactitude, the absolute rigor of natural laws, their harmony and simplicity, suggest to many an inevitable, eternal, inexorable mechanism, and for such as these providence recedes behind the iron wheels of a clock in perpetual motion. They fail to reflect on the indubitable fact of freedom and autocracy in thinking beings. A man disposes at his will of creatures organized like himself, he can snare birds in the air, fish in the water and wild beasts in the forest. He can cut down or burn entire forests, he can mine and blast rocks, or even mountains, he can modify all forms about him. And yet, notwithstanding the supreme analogies of nature, he refuses to believe that other intelligent beings might at their will disintegrate and consume worlds. Extinguish suns by a breath or reduce them to starry dust, being so great that they are too much for our faculty of sight, even as we, in our turn, are probably inappreciable to the eye of the might or worm. And if such beings exist without the universe being destroyed a thousand times over, must we not admit that they are under obedience to a supreme will, a wise and omnipotent force, which forbids them to annihilate worlds? Even as it forbids us to destroy the swallow's nest and the chrysalis of the butterfly? For the magus who is conscious of this power in the deep places of his nature and who discerns in universal law the instruments of eternal justice, the seal of Solomon, his keys and his ring are tokens of supreme royalty. The next questions concern the prediction of things to come by means of reliable calculations and the working of good or evil by magical influence. 
The answers are in this wise. Two chess players of equal skill being seated at a table and having opened the game, which of them will win? Assuredly the more watchful of the two. If I knew the preoccupations of both, I could foresee certainly the result of their match. To foresee is to win at chess, and it is the same in the game of life. In life nothing comes by chance, chance is the unforeseen, but that which the ignorant fail to perceive in advance has been accounted for already by the sage. All events, like all forms, result either from a conflict or from a balancing of forces, which forces can be represented by numbers. The future may thus be determined in advance by calculation. Every extreme action is counterpoised by an equivalent reaction. So laughter presages tears, and for this reason our Saviour said, Blessed are those who mourn. He said also, and again for the same reason, He that exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. Today Nebuchadnezzar is a god, tomorrow he will be changed into a beast. Today Alexander makes his triumphal entry into Babylon and has incense offered to him on all the altars, but tomorrow he will die in a state of degraded drunkenness. The future is in the past, and the past is also in the future. When genius foresees, it remembers. Effects are linked together so inevitably and so exactly to their causes, and become on their own part the causes for further effects in such conformity with the first as regards their manner of production. That a single fact may reveal to a seer an entire succession of mysteries. The coming of Christ makes that of Antichrist a certainty, but the advent of Antichrist will precede the triumph of the Holy Spirit. The money-seeking epoch in which we now live is the precursor of more lavish charities and of greater good works than the world has yet known. But it must be understood that the will of man modifies blind causes and that a single impetus started by him may change the equilibrium of an entire world. If such is man's power in the world under his dominion, what must be that of the intelligences which rule the suns? The least of the egregores, with a breath, and by dilating suddenly the latent caloric of our earth, might shatter and reduce it into a cloud of dust. Man also can dissipate by a breath all the happiness of one of his kind. Human beings are magnetist like worlds, like suns, they irradiate their particular light, some are more absorbent, some give forth more freely. No one is isolated in this world, each is a fatality or a providence. Augustus and Cinna encounter. Both are proud and implacable, and hereof is fatality. That fatality makes Cinna seek to slay Augustus, who is impelled as fatally to punish him, but he elects to forgive. Here fatality is changed into providence, and the epoch of Augustus, inaugurated by this sublime beneficence, was worthy to witness the birth of him who said, Forgive your enemies. By extending his mercy to Cinna, Augustus atoned for all the revenge of Octavius. So long as man is subject to the dictates of fatality, he is profane, that is to say, a man who must be excluded from the sanctuary of knowledge, because in his hands knowledge would become a terrible instrument of destruction. On the contrary, the man who is free, who governs by understanding the blind instincts of life, is essentially a preserver and repairer, for nature is the domain of his power and the temple of his immortality. When the uninitiated seeks to do good the result is evil. On the other hand, the true initiate can never will to do evil, if he strikes it is to chastise and to cure. The breath of the uninitiated is deadly, that of the initiate is life-giving. He who is profane suffers that others may suffer also, but the initiate endures in order that others may be spared. He who is profane steeps his arrows in his own blood and poisons them. He who is initiated cures the most cruel wounds by a single drop of his blood. The last questions are what must be done to become a true magician and in what precisely do the powers of black magic consist. Now, he who disposes of the secret forces of nature and yet does not risk being crushed by them, he is a true magician. He is known by his works and by his end, which is always a great sacrifice. Zoroaster created the primitive doctrines and civilizations of the East, after which he vanished in a tempest like Oedipus. Orpheus gave poetry to Greece and with that poetry the beauty of all high things. He then perished in an orgy in which he refused to join. 
All his virtues notwithstanding, Julian was only an initiate of black magic, his death was that of a victim and not of a martyr. It was an annihilation and a defeat, he failed to understand his epoch. Though acquainted with the doctrine of transcendental magic, he misapplied the ritual. Apollonius of Tyana and Synesius were simply wonderful philosophers. They cultivated the true science but did nothing for posterity. At their period the Magi of the Gospel reigned in the three parts of the known world, and the oracles were silenced by the cries of the Babe of Bethlehem. The King of Kings, the Magus of all Magi, had come into the world and the ritual worships, the laws, the empires, all were changed. There is a void in the world of marvels between Jesus Christ and Napoleon. That incarnate word of battle, that armed Messiah who was the bearer of the last name, came blindly and unconsciously to complete the Christian message. This revelation had so far taught us how to die, but the Napoleonic civilization has shown us how to conquer. The two messages, sacrifice and victory, how to suffer, to die, to strive and to overcome, contrary as they are in appearance, comprise in their union the great secret of honor. Cross of the Savior and Cross of Valor, you are incomplete when apart from one another, for he only knows how to conquer who has learned self-devotion, even to death, and how can this be attained except by belief in eternal life. Though he died in appearance, Napoleon is destined to return in the person of one who will realize his spirit. Solomon and Charlemagne will return also in the person of a single monarch, and then is he. John the Evangelist, who according to tradition shall be reborn at the end of time, will appear as sovereign pontiff, the apostle of understanding and of love. The combination of these two rulers, announced by all the prophets, will bring about the wonder of the world's regeneration. The science of the true magician will be then at its zenith, for so far our workers of miracles have been for the most part sorcerers and bondsmen, that is to say, the blind instruments of chance. Now, the masters whom fatality casts upon the world are soon overthrown thereby, and those who conquer in the name of their passions shall fall the prey of those passions. When Prometheus in his jealousy of Jupiter stole the thunderbolts of the god, he sought to create an immortal eagle, but what he made and immortalized was a vulture. We hear in another fable of that impious king Ixion, who would have ravished the queen of heaven, but that which he received in his arms was a faithless cloud, and he was bound by fiery serpents to the inexorable wheel of destiny. These profound allegories are a warning to false adepts, profaners of magic science and partisans of black magic. The power of black magic is a contagion of vertigo and an epidemic of unreason. The fatality of passion is like a fiery serpent which twists and writhes about the world devouring the souls therein. But intelligence, peaceable, smiling and full of love, represented by the mother of God, sets her foot upon its head. Fatality consumes itself and is that old serpent of Kronos eternally devouring its tail. Rather there are two hostile serpents striving one with another, until such time as harmony intervenes to enchant them and make them interlace peaceably around the caduceus of Hermes. Conclusion The most intemperate and absurd of all faiths is to believe that there is no universal and absolute intelligent principle. It is a faith, since it involves the negation of the indefinite and indefinable. It is intemperate, for it is isolating and desolating, it is absurd, because it supposes complete nothing in place of most complete perfection. In nature all is preserved by equilibrium and renewed by activity. Equilibrium in order and activity signifies progress. The science of equilibrium and movement is the absolute science of nature. Man by its aid can produce and direct natural phenomena as he rises ever towards intelligence that is higher and more perfect than his own. Moral equilibrium is the concurrence of science and faith, distinct in their forces but joined in their action to endow the spirit and heart of man with that rule which is reason. The science which denies faith is not less unreasonable than the faith which denies science. The object of faith cannot be defined and still less denied by science. Science, on the contrary, is itself called to substantiate the rational basis of the hypotheses of faith. An isolated belief does not constitute faith, because it lacks authority and hence moral guarantee, it tends to fanaticism and superstition. Faith is the confidence which is imparted by religion, that is to say, 
by the communion of belief. True religion is constituted by universal suffrage. It is therefore ever and essentially Catholic, that is to say, universal. It is an ideal dictatorship proclaimed generally in the revolutionary domain of the unknown. When the law of equilibrium is understood more adequately it will put an end to all the wars and revolutions of the old world. There has been conflict between powers as between moral forces. The papacy is blamed because it clings to temporal power, but what is forgotten is the Protestant tendency towards usurpation of spiritual power. So long as the royalties put forward a pretension to be popes, so long will the popes be driven, by the same law of equilibrium, to the pretension of being kings. The whole world continues to dream of unity in political power, but it does not understand the power resident in equilibrated dualism. Confronted by the royal usurpers of spiritual power, if the Pope were king no longer, he would be no longer anything. In the temporal order he is subject, like others, to the prejudgments of his time. He dare not therefore abdicate his temporal power, if such abdication would be a scandal for a considerable part of the world. When the sovereign opinion of the universe shall have proclaimed publicly that a temporal prince cannot be Pope. When the Tsar of all the Russias and the King of Great Britain shall have renounced their derisive priesthood, the Pope will know that which remains to be done on his own part. Till then he must struggle, and if needs be must die, to maintain the integrity of St. Peter's patrimony. The science of moral equilibrium will put an end to religious disputes and philosophical blasphemies. Men of understanding will be also men of religion when it comes to be recognized that religion does not impeach the freedom of conscience. And when those who are truly religious shall respect that science which recognizes on its own part the existence and necessity of an universal religion. Such science will flood the philosophy of history with new light, and will furnish a synthetic plan of all the natural sciences. The law of equilibrated forces and of organic compensations will reveal a new chemistry and a new physics. So from discovery to discovery we shall work back to hermetic philosophy, and shall be astonished at those prodigies of simplicity and brilliance which have been for so long and long forgotten. Philosophy in that day will be exact like mathematics. For true ideas, being those which are identical with the living order and so constituting the science of reality, shall combine with reason and justice to furnish exact proportions and equations as rigorous as numbers. Error thenceforth will be possible to ignorance alone, and true knowledge will be free from self-deception. Aestheticism will be subordinated no longer to caprices of taste which change as fashions change. If the beautiful is the splendor of the true, we shall be able to calculate without error the radiation of a light of which the source shall be certainly known and determined with exact precision. Poetry will abound no longer with foolish and subversive tendencies, nor will poets be those dangerous enchanters whom Plato crowned with flowers and banished from his republic. They will be rather magicians of reason and gracious mathematicians of harmony. Does this mean that the earth will become an Eldorado? No, for so long as humanity exists, there will be children, meaning those who are weak, small, ignorant and poor. But society will be governed by its true masters, and there will be no irremediable evil in human life. It will be understood that the divine miracles are those of eternal order, and the phantoms of imagination will be worshipped no longer on the faith of unexplained wonders. The abnormal character of certain phenomena is only a proof of our ignorance in the presence of the laws of nature. When God designs to communicate the knowledge of Himself He enlightens our reason and does not seek to confound or surprise it. In that day we shall know the utmost limit of the power of man who is created in the image of God. We shall realize that he also is a creator in his own sphere and that his goodness, directed by eternal reason, is a lower providence for beings which are placed by nature under his influence and domination. Religion will then and forevermore have nothing to fear from progress, and will follow in the course thereof. The blessed Vincent de Larens, a doctor justly venerated in the golden chain of Catholicism, expresses admirably this accord between progress and conservative authority. According to him, true faith is worthy of our confidence only on account of that invariable authority which safeguards its dogmas from the caprices of human ignorance. This notwithstanding, adds Vincent de Larens, such immobility is not death. On the contrary, 
it preserves a germ of life for the future. That which we believe today without understanding will be understood by the future, which will rejoice in the knowledge thereof. Posteritas intellectum gratulator, quat antivitustas non intellectum venerabator. If therefore we are asked whether all progress is excluded from the religion of Christ Jesus, the answer is no, assuredly, for great is the progress expected. Who indeed would be so jealous of humanity and at such enmity with God as to wish to hinder progress? But the condition is that it should be progress in reality, and not change of belief. Progress is the growth and development of each thing according to its class and its nature. Disorder is confusion and the medley of things and their nature. There must be undoubtedly a difference in the degrees of intelligence, science and wisdom, as much for men in general as for each man in particular, according to the natural succession of epochs in the Church. But so only that all be conserved and that dogma shall ever cherish the same spirit and maintain the same definition. Religion should develop souls successively, as life develops bodies which remain the same through all the stages of their growth. How great is the difference between the infantile flower of early years and the maturity of age! The old notwithstanding are the same in respect of personality as they were in boyhood, it is the exterior and the appearances which have changed. The limbs of an infant in the cradle are exceedingly frail, yet are they the same organs, having the same root principles, as those of the man, and this must be so, for otherwise there is deformity or death. The analogy obtains in the religion of Jesus Christ, for progress therein is fulfilled according to the same conditions and following similar laws. It grows with the years, with the years it increases in strength, but nothing is added to the sum total of its being. It was born complete and perfect in respect of proportions, and it grows and extends without changing. Our fathers sowed the wheat, and our nephews ought not to reap tares. The intermediate crops change nothing in the nature of the grain, we leave it perforce as we take it. Catholicism planted roses, and is it for us to substitute brambles? No, unquestionably, otherwise, woe to us! The balm and cinnamon of this spiritual paradise must not change in our hands to aconite and poison. All whatsoever which in the church, that lovely land of God, has been sown by the fathers must be cultivated and nourished by the sons. This only must grow, and this alone blossom, but it may increase, and it should develop. As a fact, God permits that the dogmas of His heavenly philosophy shall be studied, developed, polished in a certain sense, but that which is forbidden is to change them, and that which is a crime is to prune them or to mutilate. May new light come down on them and the wise distinctions multiply, but let them ever preserve their fullness, their integrity, and their native quality. Let us therefore take it for granted that all conquests of science in the past have been achieved for the profit of the universal church, and, with Vincent de Larens, let us allocate thereto the undivided heritage of all progress to come. Unto her be the great aspirations of Zoroaster and all discoveries of Hermes, hers be the key of the holy arch and the ring of Solomon, for she represents the holy and immutable hierarchy. She is stronger by reason of her struggles and is grounded by her apparent falls in still greater stability. She suffers in order that she may reign, she is cast down that she may be exalted in her rising, and she dies that she may rise again. We must be prepared, says Kant Joseph de Maester, for a great event in the divine order, we are moving towards it at an accelerated pace, which must be manifest to all observers, while striking oracles announce that the hour is at hand. Many prophecies in the Apocalypse have reference to these modern times. One writer has gone so far as to say that the event is already inaugurated and that the French nation is destined to become the great instrument of the most mighty of all revolutions. There is perhaps no truly religious man in all Europe, I speak of the educated classes, who is not in expectation of something extraordinary at this present moment. Does a general presentiment of the kind count for nothing? Go back through past ages, even to the birth of our Saviour. At that period a high and mysterious voice, beginning in the eastern realms, proclaimed that the East was about to triumph, that a conqueror would come out of Judea, that a divine infant was given us. That he would descend from highest heaven and restore the golden age upon the earth. Such ideas were spread abroad everywhere, 
and as they lent themselves to poetry above all things, they were taken over by the greatest of Latin poets and emblazoned with brilliant hues in his polio. Today, as in the time of Virgil, the universe is in expectation, and how on our part shall we despise such strong persuasion, or by what right condemn those who are devoted to sacred researches on the indications of divine signs? If you seek proof of what is in store, look at the sciences themselves, consider the progress of chemistry, of astronomy also, and you will see where they are leading. Would you think, for example, that Newton takes us back to Pythagoras and that it will be proved presently that the heavenly bodies are set in motion, like human bodies, by intelligences joined thereto? We know not how, but this is what is on the point of being verified beyond all dispute. Such doctrine may seem paradoxical and even ridiculous, because current opinion imposes this view. But let us wait till the natural affinity of religion and science marry both in the mind of a single man of genius. His advent cannot be far off, and then the opinions which now seem bizarre or irrational will become axioms which no one will question, while people will talk of our present stupidity as they now speak of medieval superstition. 370. According to St. Thomas, and it is a beautiful utterance, all that God wills is just, but that which is just should not be so designated only because God wills it, non ex hoc dissiter justum quat deus ill advolt. The moral doctrine of the future is contained herein, and from its fruitful principle one deduction follows immediately, not only is it good from the standpoint of faith to do what is ordained by God, but even from the standpoint of reason it is excellent and rational to obey Him. Man can therefore say, I do good not only because God wills it but because I also will. The will of humanity may be thus at once free and in conformity, for reason, demonstrating in an irrecusable fashion the wisdom of the prescriptions of faith, will act on its proper impulse by following the divine law, of which reason thus becomes, as it were, the human sanction. From that time forward superstition and impiety will be no longer possible, while from these considerations it follows that in religion and in practical, that is to say, in moral, philosophy, there will be an absolute authority. And moral dogmas will alone be revealed and established. Till then we shall have the pain and consternation of seeing daily the most simple and universal questions of right and duty challenged, while if blasphemies are reduced to silence. It is one thing to impose such silence but another to persuade and convert. So long as transcendent magic was profaned by the wickedness of men, the Church of Necessity proscribed it. False Gnostics have discredited that name of Gnosticism which was once so pure, sorcerers have outraged the children of the Magi. But religion, that friend of tradition and guardian of the treasures of antiquity, can no longer reject a doctrine anterior to the Bible and in perfect accord with traditional respect for the past. As well as with our most vital hopes for progress in the future. The common people are initiated by toil and by faith into the right of property and knowledge. There will be always such a people, as there will be children always. But when the aristocracy, endowed with wisdom, shall become a mother to the people, the path of personal, successive, gradual emancipation will be open to all. And he that is called will thereby be enabled through his own efforts to attain the rank of the elect. This is that mystery of the future which antique initiation concealed in its dark recesses. The miracles of nature made subject to the will of man are reserved for the elect to come. The crook of the priesthood shall become the rod of miracles. It was so in the time of Moses and of Hermes, it will be so again. The scepter of the magus will be that of the world's king or emperor. And that person will by right be first among men who shall have shown himself greatest of all in knowledge and in virtue. Magic, at that time, will be no longer an occult science except for the ignorant, it will be one that is incontestable for all. Then shall universal revelation resolder one to another all links of its golden chain, the human epoch will close and even the efforts of titans will have served only to restore the altar of the true God. All forms which have clothed the divine thought successively will be reborn immortal and perfect. All those features sketched by the successive art of nations will be united to form the perfect image of God. Having been purified and brought out of chaos, dogma will give birth naturally to an infallible ethic, and the social order will be constituted on this basis. 
systems which are now in warfare are dreams of the twilight, let them pass. The sun shines and the earth follows its course, distracted is he who doubts that the day is coming. Distracted also are those who say that Catholicism is only a dead trunk and that we must put the axe there too. They do not see that beneath its dry bark the living tree is renewed unceasingly. Truth has no past and no future, it is eternal, it is not that which ends, it is our dream only. Hammer and hatchet, which destroy in the sight of man, are in God's hand as the knife of a pruner, and the dead branches, being superstitions and heresies in religion. Science and politics, can alone be lopped from the tree of everlasting convictions and beliefs. It has been the purpose of this history of magic to demonstrate, that, at the beginning, the symbols of religion were those also of science, which was then in concealment. May religion and science, reunited in the future, give help and shew love to one another, like two sisters, for theirs has been one cradle. Here ends the history of magic. Appendix Author's Preface Prefixed to the First Edition 371 The works of Eliphaz Levi on the science of the ancient Magi are intended to form a complete course, divided into three parts. The first part contains the doctrine and ritual of transcendental magic, the second is the history of magic, and the third will be published later under the title of The Key to the Great Mysteries. Taken separately, each of these parts gives a complete instruction and seems to contain the whole science, but in order to a full understanding of one it is indispensable to study the two others carefully. The triadic division of our undertaking has been imposed by the science itself, because our discovery of its great mysteries rests entirely upon the significance which the old hierophants attached to numbers. Three was for them the generating number, and in the exposition of every doctrine they had regard to, a, the theory on which it was based, b, its realization and, c, its application to all possible uses. Whether philosophical or religious, thus were dogmas formed, and thus the dogmatic synthesis of that Christianity which was heir of the Magi imposes on our faith the recognition of three persons in one God and three mysteries in universal religion. We have followed in the arrangement of the two works already published, and shall follow in the third work, the plan indicated by the Kabbalah, that is to say, by the purest tradition of occultism. Our doctrine and ritual are each divided into twenty-two chapters distinguished by the twenty-two letters of the Hebrew alphabet. We have set at the head of each chapter the letter thereto belonging and the Latin words which, according to the best writers, represent its hieroglyphical meaning. For example, at the head of the first chapter will be found 1a. The Recipient Disciplina Ensof Kether the explanation is that the letter Aleph equivalent to A in Latin, and having the number 1 as its numerical value, signifies the recipient. The man who is called to initiation, the qualified personality, corresponding to the bachelor of the tarot. It signifies also disciplina, or dogmatic solepsis, ensof, or being in its general and primary conception, and finally, kether, or the crown, which, in Kabbalistic theology, is the first and obscure idea of divinity. The chapter in question is the development of the title and the title contains hieroglyphically the whole chapter. The history of magic, which follows, narrates and explains, according to the general theory of the science furnished in the doctrine and ritual, the realization of that science through the ages. As the introduction explains, it is constituted in harmony with the number seven, the septenary being the number of the creative week and of divine realization. The key to the great mysteries will be established on the number four, which is that of the enigmatic forms of the Sphinx and of elementary manifestations. It is also the number of the square and of force. In the book referred to, certitude will be established on irremovable bases. The enigma of the Sphinx will have its complete solution and our readers will be provided with that key of things kept secret from the foundation of the world which the learned postal only dared to depict enigmatically in one of his most obscure books. Giving no satisfactory explanation. The history of magic explains the affirmations found in the doctrine and ritual, the key of the great mysteries will complete and explain the history of magic. In this manner, for the attentive reader at least, we trust that nothing will be found wanting in our revelation of the secrets of Jewish Kabbalism and of supreme magic, 
whether that of Zoroaster or of Hermes. The writer of these books gives lessons willingly to serious and interested persons in search of these. But once and for all he desires to forewarn his readers that he tells no fortunes, does not teach divination, makes no predictions, composes no filters and lends himself to no sorcery and no evocation. He is a man of science, not a man of deception. He condemns energetically whatsoever is condemned by religion, and hence he must not be confounded with persons who can be approached without hesitation on a question of applying their knowledge to a dangerous or illicit use. For the rest he welcomes honest criticism, but he fails to understand certain hostilities. Serious study and conscientious labor are superior to all attacks. And the first blessings which they procure, for those who can appreciate them, are profound peace and universal benevolence. Eliphaz Levi. September 1, 1859. The End.